The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Ah, ha, ha. And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, March 27th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA, on the program today. Elizabeth Rosenthal, journalist, former doctor, author of An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business, and How You Can Take It Back. Also on the program, speaking of which, the White House assault, or I should say the new White House assault, on the ACA shows a decidedly unindependent attorney general. And in the Senate, Green New Deal blocked. Meanwhile, the House probing Donald Trump will be getting the his Deutsche Bank records. A Saudi I, I, airstrike records. in Yemen Hits a hospital, kills seven, at least four children dead. Federal judge strikes down the North Carolina post-20-week abortion ban that has been in effect for decades. And Joe Biden's Anita Hill problem just keeps getting bigger. L.A. rideshare drivers strike for a day. And Attorney General Barr claims a White House edited Mueller report to be released in weeks. Mickey D's waves the white flag on the minimum wage hike. And Betsy DeVos still horrible. And lastly, oh, no. Well, Wisconsin judge blogs part of the GOP lame duck law. Mozambique suffers a cholera outbreak break. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry, I'm having uh, trouble reading uh, today because I was woken up again by my son. My wonderful son who is going through a stage, I think, right now. What's that? I did not do the pre-roll. I will do that right now. Majority Report is supported by Pitchfork Economics with Nick Hanauer, a a weekly podcast that explores why rising income inequality will lead to pitchforks and what we can do about it. Every week, Hanauer is joined by some of the world's most original economic thinkers in a convention-busting exploration of who gets what and why in the American economy. If you want to learn how to make the economy work for all Americans, subscribe to Pitchfork Economics at pitchforkeconomics.com or wherever You get your podcasts. So um, I was saying that uh, my son is going through a phase, and so that means I can't uh, sleep as much, which means then I have trouble um, reading things and uh, remembering just even the basic names of people. So good to see all you. What's up, guys? (laughs) Hey, you. Hey. See you guys here. Great. That's really great. Uh, very happy. We need, to, we to, need see to get you to a sleep clinic as no, soon my as God. possible. No kidding. Like legitimately, this is becoming a problem for all of us. I, those goddamn pipes. I felt the same thing. It wasn't that? No. It was this morning. It was uh, Saul uh, peed his bed at five in the morning, and I just get woken up with a scream like "Dad!" <laughs> and then I go in and just you know swear at myself, think like, "Why? What? What, what was I thinking?" building him a loft bed that was dumb that was super dumb 
And then I'm looking around for, you know, uh, I, I got to clean his sheets and pull his, and then, you know, and then I'm, then I'm awake and I just sit there. The only upshot is I got the lunch done before they woke up. That was the only upside. Anyways, uh, folks, you don't need to hear that any more than you've already heard. Um, uh, a lot happening. Obviously, we are still in the uh, wake of the um, submission of the Mueller report to the attorney general's office and um, unclear uh, what we're going to see and when we're going to see it. If that's the case, uh, certainly there have been deadlines that have been put down by uh, members of the House and the Senate. Um, but uh, Mitch McConnell has blocked it in the Senate. So we shall see uh, what happens next. Uh, at one point, I would imagine we may, maybe somebody will leak it. Maybe uh, somebody will get uh, a, a view at it to get a sense of um, what, uh, and maybe if there's, no, uh, there's no answers in it in terms of uh, what Mueller's intentions were as to who would resolve questions like obstruction and whatnot. Um, but uh, we will um, obviously uh, talk about that when and if that happens. In the meantime, um, the Trump White House decided to uh, end their uh, celebra celebration early uh, by, by uh, joining in a case um, that has been, uh, that originally the uh, U.S. government was fighting. Um, the Fifth Circuit was, um, the Fifth Circuit Court had ruled that or was looking is looking, I should say, at a case uh, involving the Affordable Care Act, uh, suggesting that pre-existing conditions um, should not exist uh, because of the Trump administration ending the mandate or the tax implications if you do not sign up for the ACA. And... Um, basically saying that you cannot split off one portion of the law from another. The U.S. government has now joined that case and thinks the entire Affordable Care Act should be essentially enjoined itself. Um, we will talk about this more with our guest, amongst other things, but um, it's a pretty stunning reversal. Not to mention that uh, the reporting is that the White House overruled the attorney general on this. Now, if you're familiar with the U.S. government, generally the Justice Department is a little bit more uh, independent than this, um, but apparently not in this instance. Because the problem, of course, you can see the problem here, right, is that when a law is passed, if the U.S. government doesn't stand <laughs> aside that law uh, from term to term, uh, unless there is some type of uh, major problem legally with it. Um, it, is, um, it is problematic for the operations of our government. Uh, however, from a political standpoint, I don't think that the Democrats could be happier uh, unless Donald Trump literally walked around uh, the front lawn of uh, the White House naked. It uh, never becomes any less of a disturbing image. The... The one thing that this is telling is that for all the talk over the years that like Donald Trump is trying to distract us. <laughs> like there's some type of plan behind his uh, ravings as a madman. It's two dimensional chess. Right. This is actually like less than two dimensional chess. It really is like, um, you know, this is him saying like, I'm going to show you consistently I'm going to distract you even from the things that I think are good. It's checkers with being unclear what the rules are. So uh, this is turning attention, obviously, to health care at the very moment that I think Democrats would want to. Um, all of the research now coming out of the 2018 midterm elections was that the Democrats probably picked up an extra dozen or two seats in the House because of health care. Democrats ran, um, obviously, on a whole myriad of issues, but the, the primary issue in the 2018 election was health care. 
And this was done at a time when it appeared that the Republicans' assault on the Affordable Care Act was over. So health care uh, still remains a primary issue. And um, the real question is, is how are Democrats and what Democrats are going to propose what proposals? Here's Bernie Sanders on, uh, on Chris Hayes' program last night. And it's interesting, um, only insofar as that Bernie Sanders um, sticks with the message and um, is not going to, I mean, he is running on Medicare for All and a very specific proposal about Medicare for All that would involve expanding not only who is eligible under Medicare today to everyone, but also expanding essentially what Medicare does. If you're on Medicare now, you pay premiums. They're low relative to other insurance. You, you have co-pays in certain instances. It doesn't cover everything. You gotta get supplementary insurance. Under his Medicare proposal, Medicare for all proposal, all that goes away. And your coverage is expanded, it is cheaper, um, and uh, it's available to everyone. And so uh, here is um, Chris Hayes asking about what about other incremental measures? Would you support those in the near term? Okay, so you talked about where, where we should go, so I want to talk about that now. The, the Democrats introduced legislation in the House today um, that is focused on some reforms and modifications to Obamacare, particularly people who are in the exchanges who have very high premiums. Do you support the legislation the House produced today? No, I support the Medicare for All single-payer program. Look, Wait, wait, system... well, I just want to be clear. So you don't support that incremental reform? No. The incremental reform that I support is phasing in Medicare for all. First year, we would lower the eligibility age for Medicare from 65 to 55 and cover all of the children. And by the way, expand Medicare coverage for elderly people to include dental care, eyeglasses, and hearing aids. That's the incremental four-year program uh, that I wrote so, and that I support. Right, but I just want to be clear about this. So if, if that House bill were to come over to the Senate, you would vote against it right now? Look, right now, uh, it's right now we are working on what I have fought for my entire life. Health care is a right. It has to be publicly funded. It has to be comprehensive. Right. The current system, Chris, is dysfunctional. It is enormously wasteful. We spend hundreds of billions of dollars every single year on administrative costs, outrageous compensation packages for the CEOs of the insurance and drug companies. Ultimately, we have got to do what every other major country does and that is guarantee health care to all, do it through public funding, save huge amounts of money in administrative costs. So that's Medicare for all. Okay, so there's lots of people running on Medicare for all, but there's been some interesting right, pause sort it for of... one second. I just want to point something out here. So the fix to the Affordable Care Act, who knows whether it would pass in the Senate? My guess is it absolutely would not. Uh, but uh, let's just assume for a moment that there was actually some viability to this. I mean, the, the Democrats are, are doing the right thing by introducing this because they want to get Republicans on the record for specifically voting against, at least in the House, fixing the Affordable Care Act. Because Republicans cannot vote for anything that helps the Affordable Care Act at this point because they all voted against or voted to replace and repeal it literally 60 times. So this is uh, smart politics in terms of getting in the House, because it's never going to actually be a vote in the Senate. And this is probably why Bernie says I, I, it's, it's irrelevant to me. I'm not, I wouldn't vote for it because I'm not going to give any cover to uh, uh, Republicans in any way. And because I'm going to vote for something else. But understand, people have to be very clear on this. The Affordable Care Act covers 20 million people. Half of those people are, roughly, are from expansion of Medicaid. The other half are people who are not eligible for employer-based uh, um, uh, employer uh, health care. And those people go into exchanges in states across the country. That's 10 million people. It's a fraction of, of the people who get health insurance in this country. 
The Affordable Care Act did not do such a great job in terms of containing costs, and the Republicans have done a very good job of, of getting rid of those cost controls to the extent that there were any. The best thing the Affordable Care Act was the PPI part uh, that did was the PPI part, and that was the patient uh, protections. That was things like pre-existing conditions, things like you can't have rescission, you can't have you you can't have, you don't have lifetime or yearly caps if you get super ill, and it costs seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. They can't get rid of your insurance because you went over your five hundred thousand dollar lifetime cap or whatever it is. Uh, you can be on your parents' uh, program until you're 26. There are certain essential services that, that make health insurance actually define as health insurance, right? You can't just sell something that says like, well, we're going to pretend like you're covered, and that's health insurance, use right? There's a coupon for contact solution. Right. You can't sell a car that doesn't have an engine and say it's a car. Yes, it looks like a car. Smells like a new car when you get in, but if it doesn't have an engine, it's not really a car. The That's film basically. The Rainmaker actually does a great job of illustrating fake door-to-door, -door, fake insurance plans. Right. I mean, so that's I mean, that's basically uh, what what it did. So when he says he's going to vote against this, he's basically saying, "Look, the clown time is over. The ACA was uh, certainly was a step in the right direction, but in the final analysis, it did not provide affordable care." That did not happen, and it is highly vulnerable to attack, as we are witnessing right now, just in terms of, like, executive actions. Continue. To all do it through public funding, save huge amounts of money in administrative costs. So there's, That's Medicare for All. Okay, so there's lots of people running on Medicare for All, but there's been some interesting sort of debate about what it means, and there's sort of two different ways that people are talking about it now. One is what you're, you've talked about, a four-year phase, and you lower it, and you get Medicare for All. The other is the idea of sort of a Medicare buy-in, right? So you don't say everybody's in the Medicare system. You just say everyone has the option to. You can optionally right. buy in at Medicare rates. That's called Medicare for America. There's a bill uh, with that name in the house that is polling very well right now uh 51 to 30 percent whereas the the sort of more traditional medical affair for all that you support is, is is even what do you what do you think about that as an alternative why not sort of slide towards the system in an optional way because ultimately we have to recognize that the current system is incredibly dysfunctional and wasteful its goal is to make profits for the insurance companies and the drug companies you are not going to be able in the long run to have cost-effective universal health care unless you change the system, unless you get rid of the insurance companies, unless you stand up to the greed of the drug companies and lower prescription drug costs. That's the only way that you could provide quality care to all people. I look at health care, Chris, the same way as I look at public education, right. the same way I look at police protection, fire protection. All people get it regardless of their income. It is publicly funded. That is the most cost-effective way to provide care health care to all. So now, uh, we're going to talk to our guest in a minute, and I think she will tell us that there are other options besides a, a single-payer uh, system uh, and uh, that, that, that function around the world. The, the irony is, is that the buy-in may be the least efficient that you could have. Because you do not get the, uh, the cost savings by having universality within that insurance pool. And you still retain all of the problematic aspects of private insurance. So, I mean, it's one thing to have, in my opinion, and we'll talk to our guests about it because she's done a lot of uh, work on this. But it's one thing to have supplementary private insurance. But if you do not have a system that is designed to basically take care of the vast majority of people, like more or less like our public schools do, um, then you will not get the efficiencies that you need and you will not have a durable system because it will not function the way it's supposed to. But we will talk to our guest about that in a moment. Can we appreciate that poll for a second, too? Because that's not a poll of Democrats. That's a poll of everybody, right? So the amount of support for a single payer system, even among Republicans, is very encouraging. Yeah, it's I mean, I, I would want to see the way they 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 phrase those questions, because, you know, I I, I had not heard of the American for Medicare. The Act devil is in the is in the phrasing. I, I just I remember doing a couple of being involved in focus groups in my brief like brand, whatever sort of time. And <laughs> like 
they're profoundly easy to manipulate. That's all I'll say. I like, just remember being involved so. in focus groups when I was living in Boston, waiting tables and trying to earn fifty bucks. Did and you lunch. go? Did you go oh, in and te- that's yeah, all? That you all you were time. like the most unhelpful focus was, group participant. Oh yeah. No, there was everything. How anything did they I let you get. in? Just as with a jury, I would lie. you should have been thrown out immediately. I would lie about everything. Wow. So if anything, the real numbers are even higher than that. Well, I, we don't know. But the bottom line is that they're definitely up. The more people hear about it and understand the proposal, they uh, the more people um, appreciate it. Because, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think these numbers would have been anywhere near there. But, folks, uh, not only is um, selling single-payer health insurance um, challenging, hiring is challenging. But there's only one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place, it's actually online. ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. But they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, or what I call it, the their powerful Get Brendan technology, because that's where we got Brendan from. Uh, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invite them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. When Brendan came in, let me tell you this, like, it was, we, we got Brendan through ZipRecruiter. They were advertising on the show, and I was like, I got to hire somebody. I should try the service out. When Brendan came in, one of the first things he said and, you know, I don't know how you, uh, you came through ZipRecruiter. I don't know how they, they got you or whatnot. First, first thing he says is like, yeah, no, I know what you do. I, uh, the last job I was on, I had to block your videos because I was looking for the raw footage of the, of the clips. And uh, your videos kept coming up. Oh. And I was like, oh, my God. Sorry, Brandon. Hell Imagine yeah. you think you found the raw footage and all of a sudden, pull it. Well, but that's the thing. <laughs> Like how much, what better fit could I have had? It was like literally like, oh, you're the guy who used to work here yesterday and, and now you're coming in for a job today. I actually, that happened to me uh, with Bartley's Burgers up in uh, Cambridge, Mass. I, I went, I left uh, for like three weeks and then they made me apply for the job again. I was there for four months before that. They were trying to be dicks. ZipRecruiter is so effective. <laughs> That 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter, Z-I-P-R-E-C-R-U-I-T-E-R.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're talking to Elizabeth Rosenthal about an American sickness. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome the editor in chief of Kaiser Health News, a New York Times op ed contributor, and the author of An American Sickness How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back. Elizabeth Rosenthal, welcome to the program. 
Thanks for having me. So let's start with um, just uh, as luck would have it, uh, the Trump administration makes what I would consider uh, a very dubious um, a political decision and perhaps an even uh, greater, uh, uh, even more dubious uh, legal decision in um, weighing in against the U.S. government, uh, I guess, uh, in this uh, Fifth Circuit case regarding the Affordable Care Act. Just, I mean, characterize what the uh, the argument is here in that Fifth Circuit and, and what the implications would be if uh, the plaintiffs prevail. Well, I, the argument is that because the penalty for not having insurance um, was taken away by Congress, then the whole ACA is therefore invalid, that that was a crucial uh, kind of leg of the program. And once you've taken that away, the rest of it has to go away, too. Um, and I'm not going to think about the politics of that so much as um, the disaster and the chaos it creates in healthcare, which is my bailiwick. Okay. And uh, so fair enough. And um, we should just say from a legal standpoint, uh, the idea that it would be severable is, um, uh, you know, the, the argument would be, well, uh, Congress had the opportunity uh, to repeal the whole uh, ACA. They didn't. They just decided right. to repeal that part of it. So we know where Congress stands on this. We don't have to assume that they would perceive the whole uh, law to be uh, inseverable, as it were. Um, okay. Absolutely. And the, and the administration is, is of course, um, using uh, its notion of, of very expanded executive powers to basically go against what Congress has done. So, OK, with that said, um, I mean, let's just I mean, uh, explain to us what the implications would be. I mean, I guess on day one, right, if this uh, case was to prevail, 20 million people would lose their health insurance at least, right? And then the rest of us would be implicated by the patient protections part of the ACA. Yeah, I mean, this will affect everyone. And it's, you know, the ACA, I think everyone who's who's kind of candid about it will say, sure, it has some flaws, which is why we're hearing some of the Dems talk about Medicare for all now. But it did really, really important things that, um, you know, the, the Trump administration has been trying to kind of kneecap it in various ways. But for example, um, it protected people with pre-existing conditions uh, to be able to get insurance before the ACA, you could be excluded from insurance if in the past, for example, you'd used an asthma inhaler, or you could find out uh, they would consider pregnancy in some plans a pre-existing condition. So that that was really important. Another thing is, is, is that it, um, under, it was behind the Medicaid expansion um, through which tens of millions of people got insurance, which was really important. Another thing it did was to standardize plans to basically make illegal junk insurance plans plans where you could think, oh, yeah, I have insurance. And then suddenly you go to a hospital and you go, you realize, oh, it's not for emergency room care or, oh, it doesn't cover pregnancy. So the ACA protected patients. I mean, its full name, we always think about it as the Affordable Care Act, but it was the Affordable Care and Patient Protection Act. Right. It protected all of us in really important ways. And those protections from business abuses, or what I think of as the business abuses that are common in our health care system, would basically dissipate um, instantaneously. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that raises a, a good point. It's one I try to make a lot. The, the, the PPACA is the official, uh, you know, sort of acronym of the, the right. patient Patient protection and everything you just listed was the uh, the patient protection part of the bill. Yet we call it the ACA, and in many respects, I think that's why uh, it was so hard for it. And I know this is not your purview, the politics of it, but I think that was so hard for for people to sort of appreciate the bill because the PP uh, the PP part of it is um, is really. A, a huge leap forward for health insurance, um, and so absolutely. But let's talk about the uh, the cost because your book yeah. is uh, basically um, breaks down why our uh, health care system is so expensive. It is three trillion dollars a year that it costs essentially uh, Americans either uh, out of their pockets or their employers' pockets or out of the government's pockets. Uh, we as an American society spend three trillion a year, which is 
which dwarfs just about everywhere. Well, not just about everywhere else. Right. I mean, per capita. So, um, yeah, let, it's the same as the economy of France. <laughs> you know, that's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. And so let's talk about like what, where, where do you start? Uh, wh- wh- in terms of maybe, I guess, if it's possible to do it, but um, the dis- in descending order of of where the 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 inefficiency exists that creates this um, this this outsized cost. Well, in, in many ways, it's the fact that we've given over health care to a market, and it's a highly dysfunctional market. So the conclusion of the book, and what I realized, which I hadn't quite, hadn't quite gelled before writing it, was that what, what's happened in the U.S. is we've allowed business considerations to drive our health care, and health is on the back burner. So, you know, what, what are our values in health care? How do we judge health care institutions, pharmaceutical companies, device makers, return on investment? Investment, efficiency, profit. Well, what are the values of healthcare? They're like caring, curing, talking to people. Those have those have kind of dissipated. They're on the back burner. And so when we say, you know, hey, we want to get to a place, health reform is about patient centered, evidence based care, I mean you know, gee, what what other kind of health care could there be? And I think the answer is in the U.S., it's business-driven, it's profit-driven, and that's a big problem. And I'm not saying you have to, you know, everyone should be Mother Teresa or we should do away with all profit in health care, but I think it, it's so out of control now, and we see this when we look at the prices in our country compared to the prices in every other country and what all of the members of the health care industry have been able to get away with in terms Terms of what they charge. I just did a story looking at insulin pricing. You know, $275 a vial for Humalog in our country, uh, fi- about $50 in Germany, even less in France and England. Now, why is that same medicine? Because we trust in the market, and the market, in this case, just hasn't delivered. Well, all right. So there's a dyna- So let's talk about that because uh, you you talk in your book about a dynamic where. Um, you know, where competition is supposed to kick in, as it were. And uh, it, oddly enough, competition kicks in and all it does is it just sort of like uh, somehow rises the price of everything. Yeah, there's a phenomenon that's pretty unique to healthcare called sticky pricing, which is a nice term where basically what happens is there'll be a few competitors in the field, and instead of them kind of competing with each other and driving prices down, one will try to raise the price of a drug or a hospital service, uh, you know, a thousand bucks or something like that, and the other two will look at each other and go, oh, wow, it worked. They're getting away with it. And so everyone raises their price. So that's why we've seen, you know, even though there are three insulin makers, uh, the insulin prices go up in lockstep, basically, um, by a factor of about 300 percent over the last uh, 10 years. Um, and we see the same phenomena all over healthcare. where what is the norm in health care? We, we insurers pay often according to usual and customary prices in an area. Well, guess what? If all the hospitals are charging a lot, then that becomes usual and customary. And so there's no need for anyone to compete. So again, it's it's a dysfunctional market, in partly because we, we've let it get that way, and in part because, you know, it's hard. You don't shop for healthcare the way you shop for a loaf of bread. You don't, you know, someone tells you where to go. The price isn't transparent. Um, even if it were, um, you really don't want to be just choosing the lower price product without being able to judge, is that the best surgery for me or not? So I mean. Um, le- I, I want to get just uh, stay and be a little sticky on this usual and customary thing because this th- this um, this does not exist. That that like means of pricing does not exist. Um, it seems to me uh, in a- anywhere else, and that seems like that's like a, that's like a hard and fast floor, right? Uh, th- so there's no there's no ceiling on any of these prices. But there's like uh, basically an artificial floor that pushes these things up. 
Yeah, and and why did why do we think usual and customary is right? I mean, that's the problem. Is rational um, because what you find and what I found in the book is usually well, we say usual and customary by geozip. So you can find, you know, a high priced area in Manhattan where usual and customary for a gallbladder surgery would be uh, thirty thousand dollars, and yet over you know you go into Queens and it's suddenly five thousand dollars. So, uh, you know, usual and customary basically just means how much are the residents in that area willing to pay and what can you get away with, not like what's a rational where, price for that procedure. Where did that term come from? Like, I mean, it, it's, it, it just sounds like, I mean, it sounds like, it sounds to me like a, you know, a reasonable person standard that a court would use to determine like yeah. negligence or something like this. But it but it, it, it sounds like it was just simply developed. I mean, you might know uh, developed by the uh, the medical industry to just sort of say like, <laughs> yeah, the obvious price. And that's just a function of like, you know, how much does it cost? How much you got? I mean, that's basically what yeah. it is. Right. Well, the problem is, I, I like to say, you know, the, the, how we got to this crazy healthcare system is a tale of, you know, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. So the way we got usual and customary is, for a while, there were there were no rules, right? Uh, and and for a while in the 70s, 80s, uh, Medicare was just paying, you know, whatever a doctor would charge, they would pay. And then it, things got really out of control. And at some point, they said, oh, we're going to pay usual and customary, um, because that was was lower than whatever, right? But then, of course, if everyone's charging a lot and everyone realized, well, if we all charge a lot, then we all get to charge a lot. And so that's what's evolved. So, And that's partly why you see these huge price disparities where, you know, an MRI in one city can cost five times what it would cost in another. And an MRI, in, in, you know, might cost three times as much on one street in New York than it would... 10 blocks away. So uh, the other dynamic, which I find fascinating, and this is um, this is a relatively, I think, recent phenomena because insurance companies are now, and maybe this happened, maybe this was the case state to state, but at least from a federal standpoint, insurers are limited in terms of profits uh, to, I think it's 20%, essentially, um, or, or I should say, that their premiums, 80% of premiums, need to go towards providing care for people. So there is an yep. incentive for insurance companies to do the absolute opposite of what we would anticipate for them to do, which is to negotiate prices down, but they actually benefit by prices going up. Right, you know, the piece a piece of a twenty percent of a big pie is is better than twenty percent of a small pie. And again, that's kind of the road to hell paved in good intentions. What happened before was a lot of insurers were only spending, um, you know, maybe sixty percent of premiums on care, and everyone said, "Oh, that's bad, right?" Of course. Uh, so you should spend eighty to eighty-five percent is what the law says. But no one thought, "Oh, well." So they're going to respond to that by just paying out a lot more claims to keep their income stable. And I think that's the problem. We assume that health care will operate in a way that thinks about the care and about the health. Right. But these are businesses, and, and they don't. You know, what they're doing is trying to preserve their income, and most will respond in a way that you didn't anticipate because they're not really thinking about – well, you want us to spend our premiums on helping people. They're thinking about, wow, we've got shareholders and we just, you know, we can't have that big drop in income. Uh, it's, I mean, to me, that sounds like a kickback, right? It's like, look, I get a 20% VIG on this. So if you want to charge me uh, double the price, great. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's, that's basically... Yeah. It's well, a, I think it's. I, I, it, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I don't think to, that's the way they, they to, present it, but I mean, that's what it is, no. right? I mean, it's like, I'm not going to haggle with you over the price of this because I'm actually just getting paid commission, more or less, by the transaction. I mean, it's like almost like the, the media buyers for political campaigns where they're like, it's too bad these ads are so expensive, but I get 15% of the cost of the ad, you know, so it's that type of thing. 
Yeah, I don't like to use the term kickback because that has a, a rather narrow definition. Right. But I think what I do like to say is, you know, basically everyone's feeding it the trough. And um, what's in the trough is is my and your health. And we're we're the victims of this, right? So it, it benefits everyone in the industry to some extent when the prices stay high because there's a lot more in the trough to eat. Now, um, you know, I think what, what – the the big fallacy that patients need to remember is we we always say like why would my insurer pay that you know the my insurers in my corner no they're not you know they're a pass through they take in premiums and they pay out claims and you know if a claim is particularly egregious they might fight it on your behalf but not usually they're too big to care about you and i you know uh, this was like a, an aha moment for me um i had a patient um who had an out of network claim and the insurer paid about $120,000 on it and it was an outrageous claim and i called the insurer and said why are you paying this and they said, well, you know, yeah, it's an it's an unjust claim, but we'd have to take the guy to court and, you know, we'd have to put investigators in to see what happened in the operating room. It's just easier to pay. So for individual cases, it's usually easier for them to pay. And they give you, you know, those annoying notes about, like, they charged you $15,000 and we negotiated down on your behalf to $12,000, but the actual price should probably be about $1,000 for a lot of those things. So. Um, they are not in your corner. They're businesses. So the other problem we have, uh, aside from uh, a pharmaceutical um, industry, which uh, jacks up prices completely untethered to the cost of these things and uh, there are mm -hmm. certain patent protections and whatnot, but um, we also have the consolidation of, 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 of hospitals and sort of like right. um, what is becoming, I guess, just a, a series of, of monopolies in some respects. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I think it's fairly obvious. Um, even with competition, it seems like they raise prices. Without competition, they raise prices. There's no, <laughs> there, right. th like, what's the option there? Well, and I do think hospitals have gotten off the hook. You know, we tend to focus on, oh, bad pharmaceutical companies, bad insurers. Um, uh, the biggest single spend in our healthcare system is hospital stays, and those prices have gone up basically untethered to, to anything um, involving reality. So now everything is billed. It's billed by the minute. You know, if you're in the recovery room, it's being billed by the minute usually, and which really bothers me because if you're staying in the recovery room for three hours, it's not often because you need to be in the recovery room, but because the surgeons are having dinner. Um, right. But your insurer is paying by the minute. In that case. So I think the hospitals deserve a lot more scrutiny in terms of their pricing. And remember, most hospitals in this country are not for profit institutions. So they don't, they're not even paying taxes. Um, so I, I think one of the big tests that I see coming in the next few years is looking at these not for profit institutions saying, do you look like a big business or do you look like a charity? And if you look like a big business, help pay taxes and we'll use that to deliver real health care for people. But I think they you're right. Um, we've let them off the hook a little too easily. And hospital consolidation, um, as you say, you know, we used to blame consolidation on rising prices. But again, when there are only three hospitals in a town and they're all getting away with it, they almost don't have to be consolidated to, um, to, to all look at each other and go, oh, usual and customary, 100,000 bucks. It's fine with all of us. Okay, so you you lay out um, in the book. I mean, so we have these these uh, major problems, and I guess the other problem too is I I implicit in in what we've already said and what you make explicit in the book is that um, outcomes. Although there, I guess there are some fixes in the ACA that 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 sort of implicate this a little bit, uh, and and maybe you can describe those. But outcomes are secondary right like we get paid they they make money on procedures they make money yeah. on providing care as opposed to providing a a specific outcome and we're not talking just about an individual we're talking about just like broadly speaking right this is like this is one of the few at least it seems to me attempts at control of the system in some way by saying we're going to judge your outcomes versus 
how much care you give. Yeah, and, and you know, outcomes research in healthcare is really complicated, right? Because how do you define the outcomes? Um, so, yes, there have been attempts to do that. Um, I think it's they're deeply flawed because, you know, big hospitals will say, well, we have sicker patients, so our outcomes aren't as good. Uh, I think really that's why people are looking more at what we call bundled care or capitated care or something like Medicare for all, a single payer system, where, um, you know, you are given as an institution a bundle of money for doing something, whether it's the entire care or an appendectomy or heart surgery, and it, you have to use that money wisely and well. So I think the outcomes uh, world, you know, it's important to focus on it. We deserve as consumers of healthcare to know about outcomes, but I don't think it's going to be the solution because I think, you know, the, the truth is that almost every hospital in the U.S. is going to do an appendectomy just fine, and MRIs are the same everywhere. So, um, but prices are really different. So even before we get to outcomes research, I think we have to say an MRI is an MRI is an MRI, a vitamin D test is a vitamin D test, and prices shouldn't vary. And that's what every other country has done. They've said, here are some standards, and everyone needs to follow them. Okay, I want, I want to ju jump to that. I just want to just, in terms of outcomes, like so things like how many uh, infections, you know, in-hospital infections do you get? I mean, yeah. I think most people... Uh, I don't know if most people are aware that, like, being in the hospital is a really, like, dangerous place to be yeah. <laughs> on some level Yeah. Uh, in terms of your, for your health. I mean, that's the irony. Like, do those, have those proven effective in any way? Like, for instance, if we were to say, okay, here's bundled care, right? We're going to give you, you've yeah. got a patient who comes in with a burst appendix, or you've got a patient who comes in with, um, you know, some type of... Uh, of heart uh, troubles, um, we're going to check on the uh, uh, on the menu, and this is worth uh, ten dollars. This is worth fifty dollars. How do we assess that they're not going like you know? One of the ways that we can make this uh, fifty dollars into you know feel like sixty dollars in terms of like <laughs> yeah. our, our profit is. We just, uh, we're going to pull back on some of the stuff. Um, like, uh, yeah, the worry is always about skimping, right? Right. The, the, the one, one way to spend less is to skip on care. And I think some really interesting experiments have been done on that. One is something called reference pricing, where some big California organization said, what does it cost to do a hip or knee replacement? And they went to some economists at Berkeley and said, we don't, wanna, we don't want the bottom dwellers. We want a reasonable cost that we're going to pay. And they arrived at something like, like $43,000. And they said, okay, that's what we're going to pay. And you patients, you can find, you know, if you find a hospital that comes in for that, we'll pay. If you go above, you're going to pay. And they did two really interesting things. First of all, it, it, it encouraged patients to look around at those for those hospitals that would do it for $43,000. But the really more interesting thing it did for me is that it encouraged those hospitals that were charging $120,000 to say, oh, yeah, we could do it for $43,000. So, um, you, you know, I think it's partly you can't, you can't do bottom dwelling, right? You don't want to pick the the, the cheapest health care you can find. But you can do, you know, I think one interesting thing is, you know, what about a target of health care where I say I don't care about the, the amenities, the bells and whistles, um, but I care about just the fundamentals of good care. Um, that doesn't exist in the U.S. And that's what healthcare looks like in most of the rest of the world. Like no five-star hotels, no fountains, you know, maybe not a private room, but just the basics. And that's really what we should be focused on. All right. Well, let's talk about, well, you know, the, the different ways of getting there, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, when when I hear like, oh, you, you're getting, you know, you as a patient go out and, you, and I as an insurance company is going to tell you, you're going to get 43 grand. Go out and find a hospital that, um, you know, you, you will cost you 43 grand to do this or you're going to pay more. And that's, you know, um, it would be completely unreasonable if it was for a heart attack. Right. Like, I mean, obviously, right. I don't have the time to shop right. uh, around. Right. But even. Even when I do have time to shop around, right? Like, isn't that a cost that's associated with, like, 
I have to go and spend my time uh, yeah. finding like a good place. Like it's one thing, you know, if I want to go buy a TV, or, you know, and even now it's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, I want to get a good deal on a TV. Uh, it's, it's worth it for me. But for healthcare, like, should I really have to have that kind of savvy and uh, expend that type of energy to get the best price for, uh, for my hip replacement? Well, the simple answer is, of course not. You know, this is a terrible burden to put on patients who are sick. Um, but in our current system, I don't think it, you know, it should be our endpoint. But in our current system, it's important to do partly um, because it will save you money and partly because it sends signals to the providers that we're not going to take this anymore. Now, and the companies that do this and do it well will say, here are all the hospitals in our state that will do it for this amount and um, will compile a list to make it easy. And I think companies have been a bit asleep at the wheel in helping their employees uh, so-called shop for health care. Um, ultimately, I do think uh, we shouldn't have to shop for health care personally, that I think, you know, um, that's a terrible position to put patients who are ill in, particularly if they have a, a more acute illness. Now, you can argue a, a knee replacement or a hip replacement. People do have the time to shop around. They often do call a bunch of different surgeons and hospitals. Um, and if your uh, your employer says, here are all the ones that will do it for $43,000, you can. it's not that hard to do. So, all right. So what kind of, what, what kind of system should we go to that would be uh, more efficient? Because there's obviously a big problem with cost controls here. And yeah. so um, what are the different models where you could get cost controls that would be durable, that would be A, right. effective, and, and B, durable? Right. Um, I, I think, you know, the one thing you can say is we have no way to control costs and prices in our system. And different countries, I'm a journalist, I, it's a political decision what we choose, but I think if you look around the world, countries either do something like a single-payer system where you get a big bargaining power because you have a single payer who can say, eh, that drug's not worth it, that the price you're charging us for that hospital stay is not worth it. Um, so that works. And by the way, single payer systems, some of them do maintain a private insurance market for people who want to pay for more or for more amenities. Um, you could also go to what countries like Switzerland and Germany have done, which is to, and Belgium, to have uh, price setting, price regulation. Um, you either say this is what uh, this procedure or this implant is worth and this is what we'll pay, or you say here's the ceiling, the maximum, and you can compete under it. So there, there are other ways to do it, um, but we do none of the above. And of course, we're not even really thinking of any of the above, except in the plans where people are talking about maybe allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices. That would be a start of moving in that direction. But I will note that all of the kind of fixes we're talking about in the ACA, um, none of those really address the pricing issue. What right. they do is they try and insulate patients from the cost, but that's really hard to do until you head on face the fact that we pay you know, between two and ten times as much for the exact same things, medical encounters, as people do in the rest of the world. So, all right. So, let me ask you this. I mean, because and I and I'm I'm sensitive to the fact that you don't want to make a um, you know, you don't want to you don't <laughs> I want have to quit if I if I've made it if I said this is what I think we should do. <laughs> well, right. No, that's fine. And I and I and I respect that as a, as a reporter uh, that makes some sense. But in terms of the types of countries that are able to have a price control regime versus the type, the, the, the nature of the societies that have a single payer, right? Like, because, um, you know, the, it, what, culturally speaking, one may be easier to implement than another right. in different cultures, right? And, um, right. I mean, we certainly, and, and going from the type of system that we have to a regime of price controls, because one of the problems that we have in this country, it seems to me, is that we don't even have an apparatus to have a federal price control system, do we? I mean, because it's, it's so fragmented. 
Well, we do a version of it for electricity, for example. You know, you could you could regulate health prices as you would a, a, um, a utility. I don't think we'll go there personally, but what I say in the book is that we will find a system or we need to find a system that respects our cultural preferences, our medical system as it exists today, um, and and our our kind of you know whatever is our kind of funky american bias about independence and choice and individualism but um y- you know i don't think we're that exceptional from the rest of the world when it comes to health care people want health care they need health care um, they need insurance this narrative of you know we respect individualism and if someone doesn't want to buy insurance they shouldn't have to um, i'm out around the country speaking about this stuff all the time and i can tell you people want health insurance insurance they just can't afford it in this country you know they 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 add up the the $800 a month premium and then the deductibles and the co-payments and the out of network charges and it adds up to you know 20 25% of their family's disposable income and they make a choice to say you know I'd rather be able to send my kid to college. And so I think we need to take that barrier away. And I do think, you know, we'll develop a system that that respects all of our preferences. But now, you know, we like choice, but hey, the one we choose is not in our network. And we don't really get to choose anyway. Right. Well, I was going to say, like, what do we mean by when we want choice, right? Like, because, like, <laughs> how does, how, let me ask you this, how would price controls um, and versus a single payer, would there be a difference in those two scenarios as to uh, wh- you know choice being limited? Well, with price controls, you know, Germany, for example, has hundreds of insurers. I would note they're, they're all non, not for profit, really not for profit. Um, and uh, so you, you have your choice there, right? Well, you, you, you have your choice of insurers. You have your choice of insurers. But I'm saying... Really, nobody cares about, have, like, choosing insurance as much as they want to choose what doctor they see, right? Right, but, but if you're... Right, but but in the German system, for example, all the doctors participate in all the plans, so you can go see what doctor. I mean, we have this notion that if you go to a single payer or a more regulated system, you won't be able to make those choices. You can, of course, you can. What what is somewhat different is there is a sense of particularly in a single payer system, you may have to wait longer, right? If it's a non-urgent uh, issue, you may have to wait longer. Now, what I will tell people when they say that is, oh, I don't want to have to wait. I'll say like, yeah, try and find mental health care in New York City. Your wait will be infinite right. if you want to go in right. network. We have waits here. We just don't acknowledge them. And I think so there's a lot of fear mongering that goes on around, uh, you know, a price controlled system, both in the medical community and in the patient community. Uh, a lot of b- even bigger fear mongering that goes into what would happen in a single payer system. Um, there will be differences. There will be certain kinds of weights, but generally in terms of physici- physician choice, which is what we tend to focus on, um, there's a lot of choice um, and, and probably more than you have in the average narrow network plan in the U.S. now. Right. A so single payer, I, think- I would assume, right? Like everybody, I mean, even if you had, uh, re- 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 you know, you, you had doctors working outside of that system, ultimately there would be more people available to uh, most people under a single pair, uh, most uh, more doctors would be available under a single pair, right? To most people. Right. I think the ch- doctors, you would have more choice. There might be certain kinds of treatment that in a single payer system, they decided were not, had not been scientifically proven to a point that they were willing to pay for it. Right. So there would be places around the edges where you might get uh, a certain kind of advanced care quicker in the U.S. Now, the caveat to that is it's not necessarily better care because in the U.S. you can sell things that sound good that haven't been proven as much. Right. Um, All right. So let me ask you this. Um, uh, Also, uh, uh, you know, from a from a purely like, you know, a reportorial perspective. We're talking about two different regimes here. One is a a price control regime 
uh, maintaining, I guess, a bunch of, uh, you know, insurance companies, although the example of that is where they're all nonprofit. And I don't know that we actually have real nonprofit or that many in this country, but presuming, no, we presuming we could get there. And then the other hand, we have a single payer, which provides the cost controls because you have a single payer who is, uh, instead of, you know, I mean, theoretically, there's a certain redundancy between those two, uh, plans, right? Because you would have to set up some type of governmental, agency that makes the assessment of what each procedure is worth, right, to, right. to make it uniform. So what of this opt-in to a single-payer type of system or opt-in to Medicare? Because that to me seems... Yeah. Well, well, let me ask you this. That to me seems like it would be incredibly inefficient because you wouldn't get the benefit of price controls for at least a large percentage of, of the care. And... To the extent that you get price controls in the system that people opt into, a lot of it seems to me, you know, hospitals would 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 jump out of that system because they want to be in the sort of more wild west system. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, no, no hospital can opt out of Medicare because they get Medicare dollars for doctor training. You, you can't survive as a hospital without Medicare. So I think that opt out is, is not is not going to happen. Um, and, but I would like to point out, you can also have price controls with private for-profit insurers, too, um, where you just peg price controls to Medicare rates. You say, we're going to pay 200% of Medicare. And, and insurers can decide if they can accept that or not. Um, but I think that that is a third option and maybe the one we'll, we'll go to. But in terms of the opt-in to uh, a public, what, what's called a public option, either opting into Medicare or opting into Medicaid, some states are, are, are experimenting with. Um, it's an interesting procedure because basically what it does is it allows people who can't find plans they like on the exchanges or through their employer to say, you know what, I'm going to pay premiums to Medicare. And it does two things things that are interesting. First of all, it, 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 it gives people an option, a public option. And second of all, it says to all the kind of half-baked kind of crappy commercial plans out there, you have to be at least as good as Medicare or people are going to desert you in droves. And the thing is, to have price controls, to have big negotiating power, you don't really have to have a full single-payer single, single payer plan. I mean, Medicare is such a huge insurer, as is Medicaid in the States, that they do have negotiating power if they want to use it. Um, so, you know, for example, with, with uh, prescription drugs, if Medicare was allowed to negotiate pricing, my bet is very quickly a whole bunch of insurers would say, okay, we'll pay, we'll pay what Medicare plays, pays plus 10% or something like that. So at least you have a somewhat rational yardstick by which, which we could judge prices, which is what we totally lack now. So would it be perfect? No, but I think we're, we're, we're now at the phase of, of our dysfunctional health system where we're looking for perfect where like, hey, we're spending 19% of our GDP. Let's just get it down to 17%. You know, we're not aiming for 12% like France. We're just, we're just aiming to turn this, this ship around. Uh, Elizabeth Rosenthal, the book is An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back. We didn't get into sort of like almost like the, the, uh, the, the sort of the nuts and bolts things that people can do uh, today when they're faced with um, uh, these prices um, that are um, uh, but a very uh, sort of a practical guide as well as sort of the big picture. So um, uh, we will. Well, I'm happy to come talk about that because I think there's lots people can do and should do because um, we as patients, we the patients are not sending signals to the system if we just write the checks and say, oh, you know, what can I do? You can do stuff. Well, we will put a link to that book at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, going to take a uh, quick break, head into the uh, fun half. But first, I want to remind you, the Majority Report is supported by Pitchfork Economics with Nick Hanauer, a weekly podcast that explores why rising income inequality will lead to pitchforks and what we can do about it. Every week, Hanauer is joined by some of the world's most original economic thinkers in a convention-busting exploration of who gets what and why. In the American economy. If you want to learn how to make the economy work for all Americans, 
Subscribe to Pitchfork Economics at pitchforkeconomics.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, if you want to support this program, become a member. Go to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only support the free show, we give you extra content every day. So uh, check it out, uh, jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, as always, if you cannot uh, afford it, uh, we will not have your finances lock you out of the fun half. Everyone deserves fun, even if you ain't got a couple of bucks in your pocket. So send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Wait a what seems like an eternity uh, for us to get to our emails, uh, but we will get there. Um, and uh, we will uh, hook you up. Uh, join the majority report.com. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. It's great coffee, great company. Uh, last night was Tuesday night. So uh, the Michael Brooks show happens. Um, why don't you guys uh, go, Michael, and then Jamie, and then Matt, while I run to the boys' room? Gladly. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, last night on TMBS, we had uh, Francesca Fiorentini, and we talked about APAC. Then a conversation with Matt Taibbi around some of the kind of, I would say, a broader political and media conversation around the failings of the Russia story and why they matter and how we could kind of reorient to a more systemic understanding of where we're at now. And a Rachel Maddow cold open uh, this weekend, illicit history of redlining and a case for reparations with Marissa Barrara Darren, patreon.com slash TMBS, Michael Brooks show on YouTube and iTunes. Thanks, everybody. All right. This week on the Antifada, uh, I think I've got some time, so I'm just going to read the whole <laughs> description. Uh, third time guest, Neryl Shaw. This is our first ever third time guest for those keeping track. We're only uh, halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> he jumps in to help us bang through some recent cancellations. A Rachel Ameto, Barbara Streisand, the International Socialist Organization, and Great Britain as a viable, insane, bourgeois democratic state. Since we couldn't get any limeys to come in and talk UK politics, we have to yank splain what the hell is happening on the other side of the world. And answer questions not limited to, but including, why is a Brexit? What's at stake in this slow motion train wreck for Corbyn and the left? How come, as Jordan Peterson would say, the whole thing is crazy? As usual, it's the political economy, stupid. So check it out. Uh, Patreon.com slash The Antifada or anywhere free podcasts are sold. Although you can sign up to give us money if you want. Uh, literary hangover. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a week and a half until the Oscar Wilde episode everyone's waiting for comes out. But uh, you can catch up with the back catalog. We did a King Philip's War. If you don't know what that is, you should. There's some Massachusetts people in here that don't know their... Uh, I didn't know it. I was embarrassed and I listened crazy? to it and it's an insane story. Yeah, so check that out. Uh, check it out on uh, YouTube. Go subscribe to the YouTube page. Literary hangover. Uh, check that out. I had a lot of coffee this morning in an attempt to... Uh, to uh, keep myself awake. You don't drink those horrible energy drinks anymore, though, right? What do you mean? You used to drink like 24-hour energy, energy and stuff. No, I did not. Or five-hour energy? Okay. Oh, man. I recall I you did. No, no, no. Well, oh, you, every you tried once it. in a you while. Tried it. it wasn't I like tried. a daily thing. No, no. I, no, I, no, no, no. I know it wasn't a daily thing. I think, do you still do that, though? No, I mean, I think I probably had uh, those five-hour energy drinks maybe like 10 times over the course of five or six seven years i have a story about well, those yeah uh, i was in the issues of death and grief class uh in a uh, college and it was like we watched this documentary about people jumping from the san francisco bridge it was very dark but we, we were watching it on hulu for the class and in the middle of a very dark moment in that movie <laughs> hulu goes to commercial and the ad is like you know that 430 feeling and it's like damn we gotta <laughs> worry about wow. these ad placements on some of this stuff <laughs> No, I, ne I never, I mean, it, you know, every now and then I'll, I'll, you know, like if I'm really in big, big trouble back when, when Saul I was, was I was honestly, I was, I week. know you didn't do it that much, but I was no. just going to note a positive that I haven't seen those in a while. Oh, and no, I no, that was a good no, sign no, no. Half that the even time, with the pipes and Saul and everything, you're still not, 
No. You know, hitting those. That's no. good. No. Half the time when you talk about your kids, it makes me want to have a baby right away. And the other half, it makes me want to check to make sure my IUD is still in place. I was going to say then you're not listening carefully enough because I think it probably should I was be closer to like 95. Like probably like 10 to like you say the nice parts off the air and you say the mean parts of the on the time air. you talk about your kids, I think, Jesus, that sounds absolutely horrible. And 5% of the time, I think if I had enough alcohol, and it could be just sort of passive enough, and there was a lot of additional care to support it happening. Maybe this support. is swingable. Oh, that's uh, that's actually both my children's middle name. What additional you just said. care? No, maybe. what you just said, like passive enough and enough alcohol. That's actually their middle names. All right, folks. Which is which? No, don't <laughs> same. Say that. We named them both the same middle name. See you in the fun half. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue if you don't like me. Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. It is the uh, fun half of the program. Uh, I am going to make sure that I remember to turn on my IMs. It's been uh, it's been irresponsible of me the past couple of days. To I know. I get the brunt of it. Do you really? Yeah. You, why don't you tell me? You never tell me. Um, uh, I think like passive aggression or something. <laughs> No, yeah, I'd sometimes tell you. <laughs> you just want to, you just want to like stew about it. Well, because if I, if you I need it for de uh, dead red letter or whatever the real it is, reason. so they can get home and like if, kill. If, if I tell you, especially if it's on mic, then people will know I'm the conduit to come to when the, the IMs aren't on, and I don't want to take up that man. Guess what you just did? I know. <laughs> you got the worst of both worlds, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I certainly understand. The feeling of not wanting people to touch me uh, or to uh, to get too uh, close. I am. I like to, you know, 
I know I come off as a very friendly, warm, and open person, but I, in person, actually, I really prefer to just have people not get uh, too carried away when they meet me. And in that respect, I totally understand what's going on with the Pope as he <laughs> is welcoming um, Pope visitors. What do you, I don't know what you call these people, pilgrims? Or um, I guess uh, people coming to see the Pope. And they're all trying to kiss his ring. and He doesn't want them to. And somebody's not getting the message. Here it is. Oh, I don't want you to. Are they trying to cut away? Here we go. Up, oh, no, sorry. Got up, 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 up. Get it back up. There you go. Da, 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 da. And no, thank you. Nope. There you go. Oh, nice to meet you, sir. Just let go. All right. Ah, don't go for the hand. Ah, I'm afraid of getting a cold. Ah, dude. Coming right in. Watch out. And good to see you. Oh, da, da, da. Nice try. Hey, sorry. But nope, not you either. Well, we're all just going to keep doing this and pretend like uh, that is the strangest thing I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, a dozen people walking up to the Pope, trying to kiss his ring, him pulling his hand back. And I guess the idea is that he does not want to be seen as some type of eminence or uh, otherworldly. And um, he's, he's new atheist Pope. He's new atheist no, Pope. He really should. Trying to make it less of a regal royal position. There's a lot of like politics of this, but what I think hasn't he seen uh, the Godfather though? I mean, that's what. <laughs> that's what. We... But I think what I think though that I, I I think that it's both that that's his political move, but I think that also if people didn't go for that move, that would also be a faux pas. It's like I when think that, make it, I think make that like they're you got to make it like you're trying. Yeah. to do it's like when you, I think it's, uh, I think you're it's at dinner very... for, with somebody and you like go for your wallet right. just to get the credit. <laughs> it's right. like that. The fake the fake wallet. Move. You have to pretend that you're going to split the check, even though we know it's not going to happen. There was a couple of people who really looked like they were just going to go for it anyways. Then and they were like, yeah, there were oh, I'm going to get that ring. Who were, who were exactly. Pretty, yeah, they were very they didn't realize that there was some political choreography going on. Hope chasers. Let's go to the phones calling from a two five six area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, uh, my name is Jacob. I'm from Alabama. Jacob from Alabama, what's on your mind? Hey, um, so I watched one of your clips last week, and um, <clears throat> it was the one about campus free speech. And uh, I had two things that I wanted to uh, tell you about. Um, I'm in the leadership of the College Democrats at, at my college, and I've been trying for the past, like, two years, been trying to reach out to YS, Dave Rubin, you know, IDW type folks, and I, uh, I cannot, for the life of me, get them to come to campus. I've tried to get them to come to talk to uh, Nathan Robinson of Current Affairs, mm -hmm. and Nathan has, every time that I try to set something up, Nathan's like, yeah, just cover my travel expenses. And Dave Rubin wouldn't even, you know, I, I was able to get in touch with his agent, and he was like, yeah, he won't even talk to you unless you've got ten thousand dollars for <laughs> for a speaking fee and i'm like do what you know that's crazy i i, I you know that's the, the the idw type folks they're always trying the, their message is that you know oh the left won't debate us but like that's not true that's just completely a fiction and and it really really frustrates me when uh, when you know folks like well, folks like that fellow that called into your show last week talking about you know the the right is their their speech is suppressed on campus and it's like you know we're trying to talk to you and you only want to peddle propaganda and uh, you know not be challenged. Well, let me say this uh, first off, and good for you for reaching uh, Dave Rubin's agent. As you know, when you're in the dark web, it is very, very difficult uh, to reach people outside of that area. And so... Um, yeah, you can't even see your phone. Right. I mean, it's very difficult. And uh, good for you for reaching his agent. But let me say this. 
I am sure that when Dave Rubin sees this video that we're going to cut from this and hears your earnestness and appreciates because you are looking to have a civilized conversation, you are the youth of America, you are welcoming him with open arms for discussion of ideas. I will have to say that you're probably one of the most polite people to ever call into this program. Uh, and it's kudos, to, fresh air, kudos to you, uh, young man. Uh, and I will say that um, uh, Dave Rubin, I know that uh, you've had an opportunity to watch this uh, video. Perhaps you should, um, you should help. I'm sure your agent is just not letting you know that, again, what school is it? What university? Do you mind saying? UAH, University of Alabama in Huntsville. University of Alabama in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, Where the Dave, spirit of the Enlightenment lives on. Thank you. Dave, well, please and, 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 let your agent know that you are okay with this. I'm sure agents, I know how they can be. Uh, they're trying to get their cut, but I know that you're not in it for just the money, Dave. I know that you really care about sharing ideas. So um, reach out to the- uh, Oh, and Sam. Yes. Uh, I, I, another little bit to that story is that the first time that I reached out to him, it was immediately after he had been at a talk at UCF, University of Central Florida, and he was whinging about how no progressive organizations ever invited him to campus, despite the fact that he's a gay married man who's pro-choice and who's anti-death penalty and pro-pot legalization. I mean, he spent like five or ten minutes well, on like, like, I say, oh, like no I say, left organization. Like I say. I am sure this is a case where his agent did not inform him of this invitation because I am convinced that if he was to hear of this invitation and when people hear your voice and your invitation and how sincere it is, I hope that they amplify this invitation because sometimes to reach people in the dark web, it's very difficult, not to mention agents getting in the way. So I appreciate your call. Uh, Dave Rubin will reach out to you because he strongly wants to speak to liberals like yourself who are not knee-jerk mean people. And so uh, kudos on you. Keep up the good work. Um, and you sound like you're going to have a very promising future. Thank you for the phone call. Listening to Sam speak politely is like hearing me speak Mandarin. It's incredible. <laughs> but I just want to follow up. Uh, for Dave's agent, not Dave, because obviously Dave is very sincere. If money is an issue, you could suggest maybe that some of these donors that funnel all sorts of money to campus right-wing causes, maybe they could give the 10 grand to the college Democrats so that there is this opportunity for a free exchange of ideas. I'm also sure if Dave started a GoFundMe to right. have a debate oh, yeah. with Nathan uh, uh, Robinson, Robinson. Um, that I'm sure people would contribute. Yeah, or maybe we could get the uh, billboard people on it. There, Honestly, like, what, if what Dave, is what Dave is, would probably like to do it, but you know he he needs to eat. He needs to stay out of the poorhouse. So I get it. He needs, but I, honestly, like hopefully we'll we'll clip this before I, you know, because I'm breaking the the joke here, but like. That debate between a Nathan Robinson and a Dave Rubin would be like, I could only go back to being like seven or eight years old. Are you going to say something mean? Well, that's why I was hoping we would close this segment. Okay. Yeah, so, right, okay, yeah. the segment yeah. is closed. Yeah, Don't okay. suppress my free speech, please. <laughs> but it was, do you remember the dream team? Do you remember, do you remember like at the Olympics when the Americans sent like Jordan and Pitt? They basically Bird. sent like, a group of the best people in the history of the planet playing basketball to play like, you know, like I'm from Romania and I'm good pickup player. And they just toyed with that. Like they right. beat the, you know, that I feel like there has to be a debate for Dave that is a little bit more like, com like uh, there, whatever the equivalent of weight divisions and debate is. I think him versus Nathan Robinson is like, Jesus. Uh, Dave have has, a little compassion speaking of the pro-choice Dave uh, his most recent episode which I didn't listen to but it's called the pro-life case against abortion <laughs> so he's, 
literally got I literally got lightheaded. So, that is a, that is one that I don't think any of us have ever heard before. Yeah. Mm. Sounds interesting. We're really opening minds here. I, you, you know what you've never you've probably heard of people. I've who, been convinced. You've probably heard uh, of people that oppose abortion, but what you haven't heard is the pro life case against abortion. Let's title it that. It's a great novel argument. Going to the IMs, uh, Nick from Manitoba. Hey Sam, great show today, sir. Now that you've talked to the alpha male, Libcuck destroyer, black white supremacist Jesse Lee Peterson. I was curious if you were surprised at how accurate a caller's Jesse Peterson impression actually was, who called in a few weeks ago yeah. asking uh, you what a man is and if you support hashtag me too. Yes. In fact, I'm not convinced that it wasn't Jesse Peterson. Was, just I like was, adding, like, uh, it's crazy. Um, Steve Cedar. <laughs> I'm going to run for Senate as your long lost brother. If you don't run for Senate, you cuck. Uh, Jamie's IUD. Uh, yo, I got knocked out weeks ago. <laughs> knocked out weeks ago at that Bernie rally. I guess his bit about worker I solidarity really did hit the b- Okay. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, no. All, right. All, right. All right. Take a take a fucking inch. Don't take a fucking mile. Ah, oh, Jesus. Smoot court. It's funny. Smoot Court. Michael, why didn't you push back on any of Taibbi's misrepresentations of the bar letter? I mean, talk about juicing a story for self-promotion. Also, Glenn Greenwald is a liar, not a journalist, and everyone should look at what he is saying about Benghazi. What is Glenn Greenwald saying about Benghazi? What was he saying? I don't think he was saying anything about Benghazi. Uh, Avuncular Trump. Less boomers whining about communism, please. What is this, 1980? Tom Cat. Hey, guys. Uh, first, my dear cat, Birdie, died overnight. I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, I'm not going to give you a... Rest maybe. in power, yeah. Birdie. Uh, well, I'll get, I'm going to just uh, I'll give you a show for, 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 for Birdie. He touched the lives of all that saw him, including those on the TMBS Discord. Can I get a shofar or a similar sound of a drop of celebration? There you go. I already uh, anticipated that. Also, good interview today. I'm just thinking that in the UK will be a similar hellscape to America if the worst happens with Brexit and the Brexiteer f- fuck boys sell off to the NHS to Trump and we end up having to pay thousands of pounds for cold medicine, etc. Do you think it's worth us British getting the book and educating ourselves now? Cheers. I would uh, hold off. Uh, hope springs eternal. Horton... Horton packs a court uh with beto the left finally has an answer to where's our paul ryan and sure he may not be as accomplished and yeah his ideology pretty opaque but boy does it look like that guy can do a push-up uh on a serious note uh, i'd like to take this time to address any of you reasonable classical liberals out there listening to say that i have a copy of darwin's on the origin of species signed by adam carolla himself that i'm looking to sell (laughs) If anyone is interested, please comment below and let's Monty Hall this thing. Secret identity politics, high time for a CEO Pope, I'd say. Shake things up. <laughs> Deadbeat uh, dadism. Wonder if your kids' classmates ever tune into Majority Report to find out things that they they can use to make fun of your kids. Oh, shit. No. You should watch it, dude. What? I'm not I'm no, saying anything. Particularly as they get older. I'm just saying. That's, not, that's, Mila's, that's a valid concern. Mila's, uh, in high school. Mila had a teacher. about everything. She's probably embarrassed Mila had a teacher who's listened to, who listened to the show. Yeah, a teacher's different. That might be helpful. But in general, I mean, again, as I say, she's probably literally embarrassed that you exist at this point. The teacher's not going to be, be like, ha ha, um, you wet the bed. Not I will you. Say it's this. not personal to you. I'm just saying all teenagers. Uh, you know, there, I do have a saving grace, and that is... Oh, Bob's Burgers. Hello, Bob. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's... Uh, you step on your line. Yep, there you go. Doe Link, Eric Holder on Melbourne says Barr departs from precedent of reports going to Congress for further investigation and decision on guilt. Barr has taken on more than his is his job, especially important given his rec- reclusion uh, refusal. Reclusion? Recusing. Rec- yeah, recusal. Re- yeah, recuse. Yeah. Uh, Melbourne always provides most meticulous coverage with the real legal experts and questionable uh, questionable DJT attorneys. Uh, top U.S. general says uh, U.S. American troops should be ready to die for Israel, uh, reported on Zero Hedge. Well, hmm. 
Uh, no bumps in the road. Matt, I love Literary Hangover, but are you planning on doing it in a historical chronological order, or can we expect more frequent democracy and chains and the reactionary mind type episodes to mix it in? Do you take requests? There will be a mix. Uh, I take suggestions, not requests. There you, oh, there you go. Uh, Colin from Nebraska. Dave Rubin supports $10,000 speech. Uh, Winnipeg Craig, now that you've gotten this Mueller coverage out of your system, can Majority Report please get back to some coverage of the upcoming Manitoba provincial election? We all know that Premier Brian Pallister is planning to call an early election, <laughs> ignoring the fixed date election legislation put in place by the NDP. In the can hopes I just of say catching the, the Canadians are so flat-footed. adorable in their insistence that their country matters? <laughs> but how is that going to intertwine with the fall 2019 federal election? The listeners are begging for it, Sam. Let's get some Canadian... Prairie's political coverage. Man, they really want that Canada coverage. I mean, college respect for effort. Ooh, Batman. That's the, yeah, that's our. We can Everybody. do that for Canada story. That's our Canada story. Uh, contagious. Why is that? The, that's the original Batman episode with uh. Yeah, the the, the way that the I am was Joker's phrased sound like and today and Canada and news. Today and Canadian we're... news. Oh, but you need like the Meanwhile, news roll thing, like great bah, white bah, north. Bah, bah, bah. I got to say, though, like you people like from like South Africa, for example, they're like, hey, we have an election coming up on May 9th and there's rolling blackouts and our country might collapse. And the ANC is fueling, you know, has these internal divisions. You think maybe you could cover it at some point? That would be great. Thanks so much. No worries. Canadians on a daily basis are just like, what? There's a by-election in a mid-sized Canadian city. Say, hey, why did you devote like. I suspect there was it. a little of a sarcasm in that. No, it's, uh, no of course. But Contagious chameleons are... College Democrats should just book... passive-aggressive. College Democrats should just book Nathan Robinson, advertise that he's debating Jordan Peterson, and then have the debate and say that Peterson never showed up, put him on the spot. Interesting uh, philo- uh, uh, strategy they there. Sort of um, did, they sort of did that at that conference I went to in Boise. Both um, was there. Let's was not. go to, uh, oh, this was interesting. Um, as you know, it was being floated. Joe Biden has not jumped into the race yet. I would anticipate that he is going to come into the race sometime at the beginning of next week, maybe even perhaps this weekend, uh, depending on, on campaign finance disclosure laws. Um, I don't know the specifics, but you are obligated to report every quarter. I think Joe Biden did not want to um, have to report this close to the date. I have seen some uh, suggestion that he's having trouble with some donors, but uh, who knows? He, it's hard for me to imagine that he has the small donor base of a Bernie Sanders or even a Beto uh, Rourke or even uh, Kamala Harris for that matter. Um, and if he's not getting the big donors, he may have a problem. But one of the things that his campaign did do, which was the exact same thing they did back in 2016 when they were toying with the running for election, or I should say 2015, was to float the name of a person who very clearly addressed some of the biggest critiques that people will have about Joe Biden as a candidate. That big critique back in 2015 was that Joe Biden represented the interests of uh, the credit card industry and against basically people who um, were just citizens who may go into bankruptcy, say, or uh, Joe Biden also had some liabilities in terms of being the one who who insisted on going in and offering up Social Security cuts uh, in a grand bargain. And so he floated the idea that he would run with Elizabeth Warren. Worked so well that time. He, his uh, folks were um, floating the idea that he would run with Stacey Abrams because one of the things that has developed over the past really four years um, has been a higher consciousness of how uh, women should be treated in the workplace and how their accusations of uh, sexual assault and inappropriate sexualized, I guess, uh, behavior in the workplace should be treated. And Joe Biden has a big liability on that front, particularly in the context of the Clarence Thomas hearings. 
And uh, so uh, it was floated that Joe Biden would would run, would pick Stacey Abrams and run with her as a VP. I don't think that was uh, ever the intent. Uh, I think it was to have people think like, oh, Biden's look at who Biden would pick. He would pick Stacey Abrams. And that, uh, you know, sort of just immediately widens your perspective on, wow, Joe is really leaning into this. Really makes now, you think. when you have the, the savvy, as we should as professional uh, pontificators about politics and readers about politics, you realize, like, Stacey Abrams probably never signed on for this. And they probably never even had a conversation about it. You might want to spitball this with her. And you might want to spitball this with her, but also before you go public with it, because this is the way, look, uh, this happens all the time. People jam other people uh, in this way. And um, when, you, when you are aware of that, you realize like, huh, it's a little bit offensive because Stacey Abrams can't come out and say, hey, <laughs> excuse me. But uh, guess what? She can come out and say, uh, excuse me? Now they're talking about you being on the ticket with Joe Biden. He hasn't even declared yet, and he would take you as a, the idea is to take you as a vice president to bolster his uh, numbers in the, in the primary. What do you think about that? I think you don't run for second place. I, I think my responsibility Oh, that is, is a good answer. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So <laughs> If I'm going to enter a primary, then I'm going to enter a primary. Uh, and if I don't enter the primary, my job is to make certain that the best Democrat becomes the nominee and whoever wins the, the primary, that we make certain that person gets elected in 2020. So you put. OK, so uh, for those of you at home who um, uh, who uh, let me allow me to translate. Um, uh, Joe Biden can go F himself, and I don't appreciate him using me as a, a mechanism to um, to burnish his own lack of bona fides in certain areas. I mean, you know, because another way you could respond if you weren't genuinely a little bit offended that you were being leveraged in this way would be, Joe, I am completely honored to even be considered to run with a Joe Biden. Yeah, who wouldn't be honored to be used as a prop by Joe Biden? I mean, and so good for her because she she handled it in such a way that she, she's a she's a very smart politician because nobody who has any sympathies with Joe Biden would walk away from that thinking anything other than she's her own person. But people who are a little bit uh, you know more uh, in touch with this stuff realize she was saying, "Hey, Joe." Go f yourself. You right. can't. You don't. You don't get to trade in on my uh, brand and the work I've done uh, for your benefit. That's not what this is about. I mean, to a certain extent, just that, just that Joe Biden did that. Well, so it plays yeah. into the criticism that people have of Joe Biden. Well, this is actually right. Exactly. This is the first. I mean, he said actually any number of things like I don't sympathize for millennials or whatever, but I. I'm someone who's willing to cut slack on gaps for a variety of reasons, but this is the first thing of this cycle, obviously his whole entire career, but this is the first thing he's done in this cycle that isn't just like a gaffe or a misplay. It reveals everything that you just outlined in terms of the disrespect to her, but it also is like shows why I don't think he's ready for a modern campaign because may, like maybe there was a time where you could build like before she even handled it like this there was already a huge pushback on the presumptuousness of it and i don't think he's ready for a kind of genuine sort of like bottom-up conversation on these things well i think part of it is he is living in a different era clearly where um he thinks that young people perhaps women in particular, perhaps women of color, would appreciate the validation in some fashion or would need the validation. And um, that other people wouldn't see that dynamic. And things like changes in our culture, things like Me Too, um, regardless of whether you think there were excesses or whatnot. 
I mean, these are important movements that have pushed um, uh, our society forward. But it's just so unstrategic. Well, right. it's unstrategic because he's not aware of the terrain. Right. No, if he knew the terrain, he could. I mean, as an example, I mean, and this would be terrifying. If this is actually the case. But if he actually met with her and they did a joint appearance together and they said, we're actually doing this and voting rights is at the center of my campaign and no one better to lead on this than Stacey Abrams, that would be both terrifying from my perspective as a Sanders supporter and extremely effective politics. But floating it like this is, you're right, just of a different era. Well, well it's of a different era, and it's also a revealing of one of his biggest uh, flaws is that he is completely out of touch with um, what is going on in today's society. And and I would say that's not just indicative, of, I mean, it, both in, in regards to um, uh, women and people of color, but you can even see it in something as banal as like, forgive me, father, I've sinned. I supported a Republican over a Democrat. You know, there was a well, let's listen to this clip here where he complained, where, where he, he laments the fact that he wished he could have done more for Anita Hill. Like and he doesn't bring up he doesn't say specifically like like maybe uh, made it possible for the three women who would testify uh, if not uh, directly corroborating her story, corroborating at least that there was a pattern there um, with uh, Clarence Thomas. But here she is. She's at, wait, now, where is uh, Humble Joe now? Where is this? Where is he to sing this? He's in New York. And what? But what is the uh, function that he's at? Biden. Humble Joe. Where is he? Biden oh, he's at the Courage Biden Courage Awards. <laughs> Humble Joe. At the Biden Courage Awards. Huh. That's some courage. I love the way that he's, um, I love the way that he's given back. That is actually Trump competition worthy. But go ahead. A really notable woman, Anita Hill, a professor, showed the courage of a lifetime, talking about her experience being harassed by Clarence Thomas. We knew a lot less about the extent of harassment back then over 30 years ago, but she paid a terrible price. She was abused through the hearing. She was taken advantage of. Her reputation was attacked. I wish I could have done something. I opposed Clarence Thomas' nomination. I voted against him. Didn't he also uh, go on to say, like, he condemned a white man's culture? Yeah, I want to hear more. But I also realized there was a real and perceived problem the committee faced. There were a bunch of white guys. No, I mean it sincerely. A bunch of white guys hearing, hearing this testimony on the Senate Judiciary Committee. So when Anita Hill, when Anita Hill came to testify, she faced a committee that didn't fully understand what the hell it was all about. To this day, I regret I couldn't come up with a way to get her the kind of hearing she deserved, given the courage she showed by reaching out to us. The hearing she deserved was a hearing where she was respected, where the tone of the questioning was not hostile and insulting, where the fact that she stepped forward was recognized as an act of courage in and of itself. Because let's face it, back in 1991, it took a lot of courage to take on a man who was so much a part of the establishment and the power structure. All right, pause it. Uh, now, this is really heartwarming. Black power, so Joe. let's just uh, review for a moment. Joe Biden, who feels that Anita Hill was a victim in many respects of a, a, of a white man's culture where she was not uh, protected, not valued enough, has already la launched his campaign by putting a rumor out there that Stacey Abrams uh, would be his running mate without clearly, without even bothering to call her on the phone and saying, is this something you're open to? Now, he will always deny it, it was never me. I would never do that. But that you, these things are not like, you know, there's not people on the sidelines just going, oh, hey, I, I'm floating an idea. No, this is coming from people around him. They're floating this idea for a specific reason. So Joe Biden, in the course of apologizing for essentially, in some way, abusing in the softest sense of the word the courage that anita hill showed goes and exploits stacy abrams as a way of launching his campaign and incidentally anita hill in l magazine 
Quote, it's become sort of a running joke in the household when someone rings the doorbell and we're not expecting company. Oh, we say, is that Joe Biden coming to apologize? Well, it's only been 27, 28 years. But guess what? I would say to Anita Hill, expect a call very soon. And that was in, uh, yeah, that was well, 2000. That was 2018. Well, look again, let's just keep un- unraveling this. He made the jump from a ridiculous miscalculation with Stacey Abrams to the best launch would have been, you know what I did last night? I finally had the guts to call Anita Hill. Right. That would have been a very good speech. That Again, that would be scary. Well, we all know the best apology is a courage award you named after yourself. So I think he's done his due diligence, you know, just like when he gave Obama a Joe Biden uh, clean and articulate award. It's just like a really generous guy. Um, he's got uh, he's got a lot more uh, problems to deal with. And he clearly look, he clearly uh, understands that by addressing it. But it is. It rings a little hollow, it seems to me. But um, others will decide uh, if that's the case. Um, Let's go to... um, This is... um, uh, Betsy DeVos was up in front of the House Appropriations Committee to answer for the way her... um, Department of Education has been uh, has been functioning, frankly. Um, one of the uh, things that uh, DeVos has done as head of the Department of Education was to rescind guidance on school discipline after the Office of Civil Rights found that students of color are suspended three times more than white students. So, in other words... One of the functions of the Department of Education, we saw it in the context of, uh, of transgender bathrooms, just reminding schools, this is what uh, the law is. We do not discriminate. If you're receiving federal funds, we do not discriminate against uh, people on certain bases. And um, when the... Office of Civil Rights within the Justice Department finds that maybe there's a racial disparity in housing, for instance. It goes to HUD and, um, you know, in terms of public housing. Um, If they find uh, maybe they find in certain uh, work environments. So they'll go to the Department of Labor and the Department of Labor will uh, amend regulations or send out regulations or institute new regulations. Well, the same thing in the context of schools. The Office of Civil Rights, that is, uh, oh, this is the one that's in the U.S. uh, Department of Education, found that students of color are suspended three times more than white students. And so there were regulations that were put out to make sure that this disparity was not a function or at least mitigate, on some level, attempt to mitigate the impact of racism on these type of decisions. Uh, I mean, we've seen, you know, video in the past of, uh, you know, cops coming down to uh, to handcuff, uh, like, a, you know, uh, uh, an elementary kid's school. And um, this is a real phenomenon, uh, of course, that takes place in, in our schools, as it does, you know, reflected throughout our society. And Betsy DeVos apparently does not think it's that much of a problem, so she rescinded the um, she rescinded the uh, the requirements. And here is uh, Barbara Lee um, asking her about it. Can you explain that, well, Congresswoman? Uh, no, no child should be treated or disciplined differently based on his or her race or color or national origin. And if and when they are, our Office for Civil Rights will act swiftly has act swift, acted swiftly. Um, children need to be treated as individuals. Not but they're as not being treated as individuals. That's why are. we had this uh, order put in place. And you rescinded that. Again, any student that is treated or disciplined differently because of his or her color or race 
Madam is Secretary, going to be that, the that Department is not of acceptable. Civil Rights, your own and Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights, indicated that students of color are suspended three times more than white students. We put into place some requirements that would begin to turn this around. You rescinded those requirements. So Again, what message does no this student, send to school districts? No student should be treated or disciplined differently. Based but Madam on Secretary, their they are treated differently. They are treated disciplined. No, if they, differently. if they are, it's discrimination. Well, then the why in the world would you and the office rescind rights. the orders that would correct for this? The letter amounted to quotas. Children Madam, are individuals. They're Madam not. Madam Secretary, this statistic. didn't. This didn't involve quotas. This gave direction on how to correct this horrible pro problem that we have throughout the country. You go to any community of color where you have schools that are trying to, with minimal resources, provide the best education they can, and you will see what is taking place. So this did not amount to quotas. This amounted to providing those tools and guidance to make sure that students' civil rights are protected. And you rescinded every community, that. Every community needs to be able to handle their classrooms and discipline in the way that works for them. And if Madam Secretary, child, thank God we had Brown child, versus Board of Education. The federal government gave us a chance to go to public schools. We needed the federal race, government to provide that oversight for address. civil rights protection. Now understand what's going on here. The I, she is arguing we we are servicing this problem by addressing it after the fact, if these kids can prove that this was racially motivated in some type of federal investigation that would take place where everyone at the school would be uh, obviously um, uh, claiming that it had nothing to do with race. I mean, this is like the functional equivalent of saying, hey, um, there's a lot of crime going on in that area. Well, we're going to have, I mean, if people are victims of crime, they should definitely come down to the police station and report it. Well, but don't you think we should have any cops on the beat so that maybe uh, the folks aren't victims of crime as much? Well, certainly crime is bad. And um, we, we, we are open 24 hours to take your complaints that you have been a victim of a crime. And the point is, is that she is the subtext of what she's saying there is this is not a function of racism. The reason why there's a disparity is because the black kids who are being punished at a rate three times more than their white counterparts are just acting badly. Well, she, yeah, she literally says people are getting, you know, you, they, you, they need to be individually treated appropriately. Anything other than would be discrimination. So if you have no enforcement mechanism and you're eliminating the enforcement mechanism, you're right. That precisely, she's saying there should be disproportionate treatment. She is exactly. She's saying we don't want any restrictions upon how we should exercise. She's just saying, like, I don't believe it's racism. I mean, we're this is a dynamic that we see also with police departments in the context of the DOJ. Basically, you know, uh, Jeff Sessions saying to all these police departments around the country. Don't worry, guys, you go to town. We trust you. You got this, despite the fact that maybe there was a couple of misunderstandings in the past. This is the same as the Supreme Court dominated by five Republican justices saying, despite the fact that the Voting Rights Act has been uh, re-ratified um, by the Senate <clears throat> um, a couple of years ago, we don't need preclearance anymore because uh, this is uh, we we don't believe that there's any racism involved in these um, these voting laws. That's exactly the same dynamic. So there's a pattern here. I mean, I hope people see this pattern. I mean, it's, I'm not nothing I'm saying is particularly profound, but this is a dynamic that is now permeated. Uh, every aspect of Republican culture. Remember what yeah. Justice Roberts said in the or wrote in the decision gutting the Voting Rights Act? Uh, that uh, that uh, 
Well, good way to end discrimination is to stop, stop practicing. R- right, it. exactly. Same oh, thing, right, right there. Wow. Right. That's that's absolutely true. And I mean, no, not what he wrote is true, but all of all of the things you've been saying are absolutely true. And I think even more specifically, uh, besides just being a total ghoul who looks like she wants to unhinge her jaw and swallow a black child whole every time <laughs> I see her, uh, she supports charter schools. And charter schools are on the record as being much, much worse in terms of these racial disparities and punishment. You'll so find that I want to swallow all them children. As well. any, it's not, it's any child of any underprivileged background. That could even be your wealthy kid who's handicapped as an example. I, I just, but pretty much any kid making underneath 40 a year is more useful as broader sacrifice. Just you, swallowing black kids would be discriminatory. Do you think she's looked up what Brown versus the Board of Education was? Yeah. You're throwing a whole yes, lot of words. and she You're, calls... <laughs> Yes, and that's what she has filed under things that are unjust. Things that are racist. Number one, Brown versus Board of Education. Well, uh, Congressman, you're throwing a whole lot of words at me, and I don't know what they mean, but I'm going to take them as disrespect. Now, there's a whole lot of things that the uh, Department of Education is doing wrong, uh, from slashing uh, uh, Pell Grants to um, uh, trying to um, provide more funding to charter schools. And make no mistake about it, understand Betsy DeVos is on the record as saying that she believes in public education but doesn't believe in public schools. And what that means is I believe in collecting money from the public and giving that money essentially to uh, private schools, not just charters. I would, I would bet anything that that $60 million that are going towards charter school funding has a very, very, very loose definition of what a charter school is. Uh, that are essentially private schools and for-profit yeah, university uh, schools and heavily parochial because uh, for her, at the end of the day, funding private schools is a way of making sure that she's funding parochial schools. And by funding parochial schools, I mean Christian schools. So if she has to fund a, uh, a, a Jewish school, God forbid, a, uh, a Muslim school, she'll do it if she knows that she can fund 10 or 15 or 20 Christian schools for every one. Bigger picture. But this is a, and I'm quite convinced that this is one of those things. Well, here is Mark Pocan from uh, Wisconsin um, talking about uh, one of the cuts that Betsy DeVos has proposed. Um, Uh, thing Ms. Lee mentioned about the cuts to Special Olympics. Do you know how many kids um, are going to be affected by that cut, Madam Secretary? Pause it. We should say that Betsy DeVos is proposing cutting almost $18 million for Special Olympics educational programs. Um, Are going to be affected by that cut, Madam Secretary? Um, Ms. Mr. Pocan, uh, let me just say again, we had made we had to make some okay. difficult decisions with this budget. Again, this is a question of how many kids, not about I the budget. I don't know the number okay. of kids. It's two hundred and seventy-two thousand kids. I, that's all. I'll answer it for you. That's okay. No problem. It's two hundred seventy-two thousand kids I think that are affected. Is an awesome organization, one that is well supported by the philanthropic sector as well. Sure. I'll tell you, reclaiming my one, time if I could, Madam Secretary, because there's a couple more parts to this. So also, uh, we have cuts that go in the special education grants to states from $3 million to $2.2 million, a 26% cut. And then also in this budget, you have a $7.5 million cut to the National Technical Institute for the Blind, a $13 million cut for Gallaudet University, a $5 million cut for federal program for print books for blind students. Uh, And you recently had a federal judge rule against us on some areas around special education. I have two nephews with autism. What is it that we have a problem with with children who are in special education. Why are we cutting all of these programs over and over within this budget? Well, sir, we have continued to retain the funding levels for IDEA and held that level. So in the context of- Sorry, I don't think I brought up IDEA. I believe I brought up Special Olympics, Special Education Grants to States, the National Technical Institute for the Blind, Gallaudet University, Federal Program for Printing Books. So if you could address those, that's the question but I would I will, really appreciate. I will address it. the broader question around. Or, or if you could actually address the question special, I asked, that's even a better way to answer a question. Supporting students uh, with special needs, we have continued to hold that funding level 
uh, that funding at a level amount and in the context of a budget proposal that is a 10 percent reduction. All right, I'll, I'll reclaim my time. I'll reclaim my time. You're not going to answer the question. Let me yeah, of course she's not. I, I mean, I'm not convinced that, that, that some of this isn't just like we're going to throw stuff out there that's just so egregious that we can kick some of that back. Right. The um, uh I use the example of back when I used to write scripts, occasionally I'll put an extra scene in that's really stupid as bait for notes from executives when they would say, like, do, get, do we really need this thing where uh, he goes out and he, uh, you know, he, he does the pirouette and has the cat on his head? He needs hey, to have it. A, it's essential for the script. But if you insist. That's almost exactly how I would do it. Like, well, I was really thinking that, uh, no, that's that brings out a lot of the uh, character. Although, wait a second, though. I think maybe you have a good point. The problem is if the talking dog is there, we won't know who he is. I, I, and then, you know, I uh, took it out. You know what? Maybe. I took it out, and I came back the next week, and I'm like, you know what? Actually, I think it makes it much better. I think, yeah, it was a great note. Thanks, guys. Thank um, you. But it is also possible that uh, Betsy DeVos is that horrible of a human being that they see value in, um, in cutting these programs so that folks are driven out of the public school system and basically into probably parochial schools or special schools that are uh, private schools that are paid uh, and for profit. Either one uh, is is incredibly egregious, but this is this is who they are. Yeah, I would say trying to deal with these things exclusively through philanthropy has been tried, maybe mainly in the nineteenth century. Or they, yeah, exactly, yeah. it's like yeah. the niche, yes, right? Yeah, I you're, mean, you're depriving kids of their right to a cost-free public education. Reading that's Dickens, what it boils down to. Right, <laughs> reading Dickens wasn't supposed to be like a roadmap. Exactly. <laughs> Um, Democrats could learn something, though, from them. Not oh, this starting is, negotiations in the middle. This is super heartwarming. In uh, Pennsylvania, a uh, representative, Stephanie uh, Borowicz, she's a Republican from central Pennsylvania's Clinton County. Whoa, you know, wait, the, you sure you want to say what party she's from? We could have guessed. Oh, yeah, we could have played. Uh, <laughs> let's guess what party she's from. Uh, you know what they say about Pennsylvania, right? It's like uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Alabama in between. Well, um, she uh, decided to reach out. Uh, and on um, on the day when um, the, uh, the, the Pennsylvania House uh, would be welcoming their first Muslim uh, lawmaker uh, to the House, um, she came up to give a, um, a welcoming prayer, I guess, uh, opening the session with a prayer, uh, welcoming, uh, their, their new colleague. And here it is. Think how wel welcoming this is, uh, for someone who is, uh, maybe not Christian or even someone who's, who is Christian. Uh, but, uh, I'm particularly if it's someone who's not Christian, um, the idea that uh, this is going on in a state house. Well, here we go. Representative Borowitz. Thank you, Speaker. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this privilege, Lord, of letting me pray, God, that I, Jesus, am your ambassador here today, standing here representing you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am, the one who's coming back again, the one who came, died, and rose again on the third day. And I'm so privileged to stand here today. So thank you for this honor, Jesus. God, for those that came before us, like George Washington and Valley Forge good. and Abraham Lincoln, who sought after you in Gettysburg, Jesus, and the Founding Fathers in Independence Hall, Jesus, that sought after you and fasted and prayed for this nation to be founded on your principles and your words and your truths. God, forgive us. Jesus, we've lost Pause sight it. of you. I, I, just, I, just, I just want to uh, just go back a little bit and just... Um, uh, it's easy, you know, to get caught up in the rhythm, but she's saying that um, uh, this country was founded on, uh, on Jesus's principles, uh, which I'm quite sure religious liberty was up there, wasn't it? You know, it? we a get a bit? bad rap, but are Jews really this melodramatic when the, we pray? The founding I mean, fathers Jesus were... Jesus Christ. Yeah, they like the Greeks as much as they like Jesus, so... Yeah. yeah, but who gave the Greeks but what wait they a second. got? But Jesus. Wait a second. It's one thing that? to say, Jesus, thank you for America 
and Jesus, everything that we have in America is a function of us following your word, Jesus. But Jesus, forgive us for what we're doing today, she wants to say. Jesus that sought after you and fasted and prayed for this nation to be founded on your principles and your words and your truths. God, forgive us. Jesus, we've lost sight of you. We've forgotten you, God, in what? our country. And we're asking you to forgive us, Jesus, that your promise and your word says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways, that you'll heal our land. Jesus, you are our only hope. God, <laughs> I pray for our leader, Speaker Terzai, Leader Cutler, Governor Wolf, President Trump. Lord, thank you that he stands beside Israel unequivocally, Lord. <laughs> thank you that Jesus that we're blessed because we stand by Israel and we ask for the peace of Jerusalem as your word says, God. What? We ask that we not be overcome by evil and that we overcome evil with good in this land once again. I claim all these things in the powerful, mighty name of Jesus, the one who, at, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Wrap Jesus it that up. you Hold are on. Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. People were saying, like, you know what? I don't like the part about how all, every knee shall bow. Um, that probably is uh, maybe going a little too far. Someone yells out. I can mean, we this start is, our morning how prep is that allowed? It's, can we start praying in morning prep, actually? That was kind of cool. Uh, every knee I'm shall bow to uh, we can each choose our own God. Yeah. Every Hashem, morning. thank you. And thank you, Hashem, for those and and social and security reports. And Jesus, and I, I pray that you let us come in a little bit later on Mondays. Uh, and Jesus, I hope that Sam got some sleep. Put <laughs> Jesus, put put a put a marker in what she said about Israel, because uh, I got a story in Haaretz about how Bibi Netanyahu told an aide, "I don't need APAC anymore because I have the evangelicals." Uh, but I guess he likes it because they still pay his way uh, when he comes to the states or something. Still a to free that trip, and my son gets to meet uh, Seb Gorka, which is right. a big deal for him. Hopefully, we'll keep him from being the first school shooter in Israel, huh? <laughs> Speaking of which, where is he? <laughs> so here is um, Representative Movita Johnson Harrell. She um, is the first in the state, as uh, I should say, uh, a, the first state representative uh, sworn in as the first Muslim uh, woman representative. Uh, and uh, here is... Here is her. I mean, first of all, th that they picked this woman like did the leader of the chamber not realize. That we're going to find the. Um, I mean, was this a surprise to anybody? That's what's really offensive. You can always find. Some person who is a religious fanatic who thinks that their religion is uber ales. And uh, but. You don't pick that person to give the opening remarks, particularly on a day. Frankly, I would say the time for you to pick them is never. But certainly on this day, uh, you're culpable, too, buddy. But uh, here is uh, Movita Johnson Harrell. That prayer in the beginning is meant to be inclusive and to bring everyone together. We as Republican and Democrat can find many, many things to fight about. Prayer should not be one of, of them. Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, Jesus, that you are Lord. I thought that Jesus was political, name, but I amen. also thought it was a, a political statement when she talked about everyone will bow a knee and talking about how if the people are not Christian that they are condemned. Your promise and your word says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways. It was directly a political statement and I think we need to be very, very clear that everybody in this house matters, whether they're Christian, Muslim or Jew, and that we cannot use those issues to tear each other down. And, and not only that, it was, at, it was made during my swearing in. I, Movita Johnson Harrell. Which was a moment, not only for my district and my city, but for the entire Commonwealth. To be the first hijabi woman to stand on the state house floor to be elected to the house is great for the entire Commonwealth. So to use my religion against me and the, to then storm off the floor, I thought number one was very, very immature. 
And number two, very, very disrespectful. To say the least. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I thought the I... opportunity of my swearing in for a theocratic fascist threat was a little bit unseemly. I hear both sides. I mean, honestly, just Oh, uh, yeah, I saw that, but uh, what about the tax thing? Why are you guys I doing read a translation that Muhammad wasn't a nice guy, uh, so... Majority Report doing apologetics for Muslims. Yeah, I hear what you're saying about maybe she shouldn't have done that prayer, and I don't like Christianity either, but I feel like you got to question why would the assemblywoman be a Muslim? Uh, there's a thing called the Hadith, which <laughs> well, I've heard about on several podcasts. To be fair... I, look, we're not going to get to many calls today at all, folks, so uh, don't hang on to too long. Uh, but one of those calls could be someone who was uh, a Christian who is calling in and wants to talk about what that means, that uh, we got to take the knee, because we know historically what that means when you did not take the knee. Uh, we have examples of that during the Spanish Inquisition, in fact, when you did not uh, take the knee. Um, and, and certainly, um, uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to say that, uh, Christianity is the, um, the mother of all bad ideas. Uh, but, uh, certainly when you see, hello, things, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it kind of makes me realize why they have a thing like laicite in France, where it's just like all religion, there's a blanket ban on it in public municipal life like i don't i didn't i don't think we need to go that far people just need to not be psychos about it but uh this woman is making me think maybe we do it's uh it, i mean it's pretty disturbing and uh good if for, we did who would it be targeted at good for, not that woman right. just good. as in france good that's yeah, why exactly. these are bad policy ideas good. i mean i get your sentiment i i actually have more sympathy for it than people might think but it's about power and what it gets instrumentalized against and actually Right there is a perfect example of that. There is a Muslim woman who's quite happy to have a civil polity where people could express their faith, and there's literally a theocratic fascist yeah. trying to terrorize her out we, of her we job. We could at least put like she a time upset, limit on uh, how long you're allowed to go on for when you're doing that kind of talk. Yeah, and you know, I really do think that probably uh, you could have given that uh, little diatribe maybe in your own home. Jesus probably would have heard you if he's so powerful. I got the sense that she was practicing that in her own home. I bet. I bet. <laughs> she was wearing her robe and everything. Um, let's uh, hear. This is a little bit more cheery. Um, so. Uh, AOC got a little bit more, got uh, a little bit righteous in a um, financial a House Financial Committee hearing. Um, she has been going gangbusters, apparently, in terms of questioning, like uh, like literally impacting the entire House and raising the bar for uh, other Democratic House members, committee members on how she questions or how people uh, question. Um, at one point, um, the guy from uh, the real world, what's his name? Uh Sean Duffy, a uh, congressman from uh, Wisconsin, right? Um, he um, was talking about, you know, who's going to pay for, um, he was talking about a lot of uh, economic issues, frankly, um, that are problematic if we implement a lot of the Green New Deal mandates. And... The irony is, of course, that everyone was complaining about all of the economic policies that were embedded in the Green New Deal proposal. Yet it becomes clearer when you're addressing that critique. When you're when you're addressing the critique of the Green New Deal, that it's going to displace people and that coal miners aren't going to have jobs. The Green New Deal puts in more funding. Not only for retraining coal miners. But also, do you remember this? Allowing coal miners who may not be able to switch jobs at age 45 or 50 to basically just get funding to live their lives. Retire early. Yeah. God forbid. That's way more than they're getting now. And that's all these things, like a job guarantee, right, is built into the Green New Deal to address... The things that, uh, what's his name again? Duffy? Duffy says. 
Now, of course, he tries to make it because AOC is from New York and because she's a woman, I suspect, who, you know, um, is young, tries to sell the elite thing. And here is her response. This is number three. But aside from that, when we talk about uh, the concern of the environment as an elitist concern, one year ago, I was waitressing in a taco shop in downtown Manhattan. I just got health insurance for the first time a month ago. This is not an elitist issue. This is a quality of life issue. You want to tell people that their concern and their desire for clean air and clean water is elitist? Tell that to the kids in the South Bronx, which are suffering from the highest rates of childhood asthma in the country. Tell that to the families in Flint, whose kids have their blood is ascending in, in lead levels. Their brains are damaged for the rest of their lives. Call them elitist. You're telling them that those kids are trying to get on a plane to Davos? People are dying. They are dying. And the response across the other side of the aisle is to introduce an amendment five minutes before a hearing and a markup. This is serious. This should not be a partisan issue. This is about our constituents and all of our lives. Iowa, Nebraska, broad swaths, swaths of the Midwest are drowning right now underwater. Farms, towns that will never be recovered and never come back. And we're here and, and people are more concerned about helping oil companies than helping their own families? I don't think so. I don't think so. This is about our lives. This is about American lives. And it should not be partisan. Science should not be partisan. This, we are facing a national crisis. And if we do not ascend to that crisis, if we do not ascend to the, to, to the levels in which we were threatened at the Great Depression, when we were threatened in World War II, if we do not ascend to those levels, if we tell the American public that we are more willing to invest and bail out big banks than we are willing to invest in our farmers and our urban families, then I don't know what we're here doing. Can work out the way you want it, child. Go off, Queen. It's a little tough. She gonna be uh, thirty-five by twenty twenty-four. Can we get the? Uh, can we find that out? Twenty twenty-eight, right? No, she's twenty-eight. So no. Twenty twenty-eight. Twenty twenty-eight. Oh. As my, my woke bros uh, producer, Rob Lopez, who's from the Bronx, said that that video was like his mom telling him, no, you cannot stay out past your curfew. Right. We <laughs> um, got a curfew, all right. The human race has a curfew. The other clip, I mean, she she went on uh, about, uh, uh, you know, having, but it's it's more or less the same, right? I mean, I think it covers a lot of the same territory. I mean, right now we have in... Um, is it North Dakota or Montana? I mean, we had uh, Native Americans, uh, a tribe, Nebraska, who were completely um, isolated for two or three weeks because of uh, floods in uh, South Dakota. Um, whole towns just destroyed. And it, these things don't come back. And to show how like unprepared this country is for it, not only are the Native Americans who you, you think like are under the environmental gun in this country, uh, we lost a bunch. Of, we lost ten percent of America's F twenty twos because they didn't move them out of a Nebraska hangar fast enough. So like we're so flat footed yeah. with climate change right now that well, even the military is not prepared enough. Yeah, if you can't muster the energy to care about humans, you should at least care about the poor F twenty twos. I mean, a lot of F twenty twos that were hurt by that. I, you know, F-22. I'd be very curious if that wasn't like, oh, this is a good, great opportunity for us to get 10 more, you know, 10 percent more uh, contracts. It's contracts. Yeah. Well, you guys will be uh, feel more secure knowing that the job that Sean is trying to get on right now in uh, construction is building a giant seawall in New York City. Yeah. The, uh, New York is actually one of the few places where uh, you can actually do that and have it have an impact in terms of like the cost 
the cost benefit analysis is such that uh, they will build that. But in Miami, it's not going to make a difference because it's built on basically a sponge. And off the coast of North Carolina, it's just not worth it. Like there's just not enough economic activity. They're just going to have to lose uh, large swaths of uh, different uh, places up and down the East Coast. At That's least the basically. maps will be able to or will be more fun to draw in the future. Exactly. You'll get a, a whole nother. Think of the ca cartology industry that you're talking yes. about, right? Like it's a uh, it's a huge it's bringing back a dying art. Uh, Finally, a little bit of positive thinking for the market they, instead <laughs> of being doom and gloom climate cocks. Maybe we can actually create things and build things in a tremendous way. This is stop this, crying, Rachel. This is a great. Uh, this is a great uh, video. I'm enjoying this quite a bit. I've watched this now multiple times, um, and I would imagine uh, Ronald Reagan uh, uh, could uh, inform us about this. But um, this video shows um, what happens, and this happened uh, just upstate here in New York, I think. Um, Guy's driving, and he has, I think, it appears, two individuals in the back of his vehicle. They just left uh, the Hudson City Court. I've been there myself. Just, I've actually served on a jury there. Is that the ICE agents just squatting to see people leave the court that they can pick I, up I them? guess it's possible. Um, I haven't seen them up there, but... Um, and... He is apparently um, quite aware as to um, what the ICE uh, officers are allowed to do and is uh, a little bit more adept, I think, than they're used to uh, dealing with in terms of um, what they have legal rights uh, to do in terms of search. Here is this exchange. That is a warrant. No, it's not. It's a Department of Homeland Security order. It's a warrant. Okay. No, it's not a warrant. It's not a warrant under the Constitution of the United States. Warrant of arrest of alien. Yeah, warrant of arrest of alien. Alien not signed by a judge. It's not a judicial warrant. I have no obligation to oblige by that warrant. So uh, this is uh, this is a guy is Brian McCormick. He is uh, head of the Columbia County. Um, this is incidentally uh, the district. Um, the 19th district up in uh, in, in in New York uh, that uh, Antonio Delgado uh, won. Uh, go ahead. A warrant Did signed by a judge of the Immigration and Nationality Act, and an, uh, an official designated with that authority. Are you hearing this, Mark? Yeah, I, I tell him I'm on my way. Our attorney's on his way. Okay. What's that gonna? That's not a warrant. That is a warrant. No, it's not. It's a Department of Homeland Security order. It's a, it's a warrant. Okay. No, it's not a warrant. It's not a warrant under the Constitution of the United States. It's a warrant under the Immigration and Nationality Act of the United States. Okay, that's fine, but it's not under the Constitution. You have no jurisdiction over me as a citizen. I'm the driver of this vehicle. So uh, the, uh, the ICE warrant, uh, and this is coming from the Immigrant Legal Resource Center, uh, an ICE warrant directs federal immigration enforcement agents to arrest the person named in the warrant. And because it is, let me let it go, uh, because it's not issued by a judge, an ICE warrant does not give the immigration enforcement officer the authority to demand entry into uh, presumably a house or a, uh, a car, um, any type of private space in order to make an arrest. And so uh, a car is that. So uh, here is McCormick saying that, uh, that the ICE people apparently tried to intimidate him into complying. He did okay. not. Are you familiar with uh, Title Eight, Section 1324 of U.S. Code? Uh, somewhat. Somewhat. In what regard? I'm studying to be a Department of Justice accredited representative, so I've been through trainings. Okay. And I have copies of the actually in this box right here. I have a copy of a real warrant and a copy of that, just so people know not to listen to that. Okay. So you're you're aware of the statutes governing uh, transporting and uh, harboring illegal aliens in the United States? I am. Okay. And of course, uh, I don't think they were in a position to uh, prove anything. So uh, it's a good uh, little. Um, 
uh, example of what your your rights are and how folks can uh, protect uh, immigrants who are living amongst us. Let's go to the phones. Call them from a 509 area code on the special bat phone. Sam, it's Ronald Reagan. Yes, I know. Ronald Reagan. We had you on the uh, Ronald Reagan uh, line that we mm-hmm. instituted uh, that is actually subsidized by uh, David Pakman. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Pakman. Yeah. Um, Sam, uh, yeah. good video. And also, you know, in uh, immigration court, uh, ICE bears the burden of, of establishing alienage and, and uh, inadmissibility or removability. And oftentimes they do so by filing a, a form in I-213, which is just a summary of like the uh, ICE agent's encounter with the alien. And most of the time they, they establish alienage by just asking. So they go up to the person and they're like, hey, you know, I'm an intimidating person. I look like a cop. Are you from here? And the person will just admit that they don't. And they'll say, where, where are you from? I'm from Mexico. And now their case is basically made. So people need to just keep their mouth shut. Um, that's my legal tip of the day. But um, So uh, people should say something on. to the effect of yeah. like, I live around here. Where are you from? Around here. Or just, yeah, or just walk away. I mean, you're not really being detained. Hashtag um, walk away. Yeah, that's the good yeah, exactly. kind of walking away. Um, exactly. Thanks for that tip, Ronald. Um, I want to, yeah, no problem. I want to turn your listeners on to a kind of a big uh, conspiracy slash uh, scandal involving your show, actually. Oh. Um, so... Um, Michael is doing a thing where he's, um, eating, a like one of these Jim Baker survival buckets because he got to 2000 patrons, right? Yeah, I know. He's storing it here apparently. Yes. Yeah. Until so, after the West coast a, show, get your tickets. I don't want to get sick before the April 20th TMBS live show. In that LA. sounds a little scandalous. I mean, if you say you're going to do it when something happens and then yeah. you wait when it's convenient for you, you're not doing what you promised, but uh, I don't know. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, that's just. You guys are real down on it, but it is a delicious siesta pail of uh, dehydrated Mexican food. So, you know, don't knock it till you try it, first of all. But second of all, this is the scandal. I, so I was sort of like in on this and I, I bought that bucket. But earlier, like a year ago, I ordered another one. And according to the good people at jimbaker.com, who I called, who tracked the package, it was in fact delivered to your studio. And uh, Michael says he doesn't have it, which, you know, leads me to assume that you took it home and ate it for yourself without <laughs> telling anyone. Are you suggesting that this package uh, came and we, we had another one and that I would have taken it home to eat instead of uh, going out and purchasing lunch when you, for when you call 48 the Jim Baker, days? When you call... <laughs> When you call the people at Jim Baker, they say, thank you for calling Jim Baker. God bless. Now you're telling me they're going to lie after having God bless me. They're obviously good people because they said right. that they're going to lie about the package being delivered. Look, uh, Ron Reagan, I mean, the, way, not adding up. the way I eat, I probably could have and not even realized it. Like, it's just the way I, I see food and I just attack it. I don't care. I don't care if it's freeze dried or, mm-hmm. or fresh or whatever. But, yeah, I'm open to right. it. I would eat that thing. I'll eat that. Well, so, I mean, and listen, try when it I, well, listen, when I say that I would eat it if X happened, I'm not going to be like, oh, X happened? Well, let me just wait until I'm a little more comfortable with it. I would just do it because that's to what be I clear, promised. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me be clear. There was never a specific time frame. Theoretically, we could do the bucket challenge when we reached 10,000 patrons. I mean, well, I, let I, me I, clear. All the if I was a patron, to, I would be pretty it. upset yeah. about it. We're <laughs> going to do this thing soon. I'm <laughs> gearing up towards it. I'm terrified. You know, the no, other thing that's scary want... is like it's a contest to see how long each of us can last. And honestly, like we know Matt's going to win. His stomach is made of like titanium. Yeah, but like I don't want to just like here. take one bite and go, oh, I this this doesn't agree with me. I want to. What makes you think it's not going to be decent? I think we. Uh, well, 
it's Jim Baker, but I, mean, yeah, I feel it is Jim like Baker. I don't think Jim Baker is like we need to find the best tasting. Let me d- let me d- 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 let me, let me say this: I would not dilly dally, because to the extent that I wouldn't trust it, that I wouldn't trust it to keep. Oh. The whole point is it's supposed oh, to keep. Oh, yeah, yeah. The whole point, dude. Is I that this know is the whole to point is supposed to keep. Wait, are you questioning what? Jim Baker's Here's integrity? Here's the point. Here's the point. It's like uh, it's like health insurance, unregulated health insurance. You don't realize it doesn't work until you need it. If they're waiting for you to test out its quality uh, after the apocalypse, what are you going to do about it? I just want to point out real quick, because I'm still here. Oh. that the accusation was that you stole from us. And I want the listeners to remember how weird you got after I accused you of that and how sort of noncommittal you were and you danced around and you said a bunch of weird stuff. He's Wait, his, just recently? I mean, He's got his lawyer hat basically, on. Just recently? You mean just based, on this call? Is this a... What? Are you talking about on this call? Yeah, I, I acted weird about it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I said that you stole the food bucket for, that was labeled with Michael's name that I paid for, by the way, with my oh, money. Oh, wait a second. You sold, and you, you sent said, two oh, to I Michael. Would, I would eat anything. You're saying that you, wait a second. I, I you said, wait, wait, wait. For the thing and so you said, and I'm sorry, I, I get confused. You didn't even just. You, you sent two to Michael. I sent one like a year ago and it disappeared. To Michael. And according to the. The first we, one you sent to Michael. Yes. Okay, well, I got news for you, buddy. Like, you know. Uh, if you can't tell that Michael probably went out and he flipped that thing or something. <laughs> I went to a no, swap I'm meet in Flatbush. <laughs> a swap meet or something? What I'm saying is Michael has already categorically denied it, which is the obvious thing to do when you're Yeah, innocent. well, I got news for you. Michael also promised to eat the one that came here after he got to a certain number of patrons. He hey, hasn't done Ronald that either. So there's a lot Sam of is going to go on it's the attack and lie and prevaricate, but I think we all know what's really going on, which is that this is all That's part of Sam's new second. single lifestyle. <laughs> he invites women over for a nightcap <laughs> in a food bucket. <laughs> This is his, this is his new chart. That's life. my line. That's my line. It's like, come on, it's the apocalypse. I can prove it. I've got the food. I, you want a, mm-hmm. a, a, right. a taco fiesta right. bowl? Ronald Reagan, thank you for the phone call. You, sir, were the final call of the day, uh, and uh, much appreciated, uh, folks. I'm sorry, we are out of time. He I know single-handedly people- made that whole set thing a thing. I have to uh, impressive work. Uh, we got, uh, we'll do, uh, five more, uh, IMs and then we got to get out of here. Uh, Kentucky fried, uh, comrade. Hey, I'm our crew. There was a blink and you might miss it story up in potential, uh, potential front runner. Pete Buttigieg is proposing a peace between the LGBTQ community and Chick-fil-A. His campaign is proposing a two piece solution drawn by 1967, uh, orders in hopes of finally settling this holy dispute. Sam's Tinder profile. Hey, girl, swipe right, and I'll let you yank explain anything to me. You don't even need to explain. Huh. Train boy, uh, I don't want to restart drama, but if Cliff Schechter had uh, David Frum on again, loved hearing him gaslight Cliff on immigration with no pushback. Our very own Kentucky Fried Comrade uh, live tweeted his listening experience. Do you think this means Frum will do any podcast that pays him? So potential future MR Antifada TMBS guest. Oh, he is welcome to come on. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, absolutely. We'll I will, have a free I will interview of David ideas. from any time. Hi, Sam. It took me a little while to realize that Dave Rubin sounds exactly like all of your impression of him. He would be really great voice for a Muppet. Left his best. Pajama boy. I had to take uh, so much Xanax last night due to Jamie, Jamie's anarcho communism. <laughs> Jack. Jack from Minneapolis. Surprised we didn't hear Michael laughing when Sam said PP part. Uh, Steve Crowder's car. You didn't get a chance to knock Steve out in a debate, so I did you a favor and destroyed him myself. What did he, what happened? He's okay, uh, but he got in a car accident. Oh, apparently. is that right? Oh, yeah. geez, I had no idea. <laughs> Bullprog. Michael Voice. I'm Jesus. Michael Brooks on tonight's show. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. Also, Facebook, <laughs> Instagram bans white nationalism from pr- platform after pressure from civil rights group. JJ, cool. Hey, Sam, if you win the leadership of the Libertarian Party, would you pledge to guarantee equal access jetpacks within your first term? <laughs> Parenting for Sam, parents hack for Sam, resolve double layer mattress protectors and sheets, mattress protector sheet, mattress. That way you can strip off the soiled set quickly in the night and try and speed up the return to sleep. You can put on a new top version before bed. Yeah. 
Uh, Rando, uh, missed the first half. Did you guys have the latest case of discussing Betsy DeVos? Yes. And the final I am of the day. Monkey Fighter 89, Sam, the fake caller, actually called and bragged about imitating Jesse Lee Peterson on his show. Jesse also admitted he doesn't know who his guests are and never heard of you. <laughs> Jesse's awesome. I don't doubt it. All right, folks. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. Finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid For the road that bends before Finally breaks you I guess somehow I lost my drive Between the 101 and the 5 Do you know how far the detour takes you? Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my Play.